Recording stopped. Uh, and I believe, Diana, we started? Or, I think I heard the recording started. It's not a board meeting, so I'm not- Recording in progress. Uh, it was noticed on our uh, on our agendas, just for the courtesy of met letting people know that we would all be together at the Board of Commissioners today, but we are not in a regular decision-making board meeting. So today's meeting will be run by the County Administrator, Mr. Mokrahyski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, commissioners and elected department heads and appointed department heads and staff that are here with us today. Um, Steve, yes. if I may, uh, to the board, um, as the presentations are being made, uh, if you have questions of staff during the presentation, signal me and I'll get Mr. Mokraki's eye, eye to, uh, to get you in the queue to, uh, to talk in front of staff. <clears throat> that works between you and I, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so we want this to be um, an iterative process where we'll be presenting a, a lot of information to you today. We have a number of different presenters that are gonna talk about different issues and we encourage you to, if you have questions uh, throughout the presentation to go ahead and ask those clarifying questions and then there'll be an opportunity at the end of uh, the meeting today for a, for a broader conversation um, uh, about everything that we're gonna talk about today as a whole. So um, we're working on the clicker, how are we doing? Let's see if the clicker's working. All right, so we said good morning to everyone. We do have some, some coffee and snacks here, so uh, we have a few hours to work through uh, what are gonna be some challenging issues going forward, so we wanna make sure people are comfortable and ready to go here. Okay, it works. Technology works. So this is the schedule. Uh, we have a PowerPoint here, so we'll kinda walk through some of these slides, but um, you also have this information is available. Did we post it? It will be we, we'll, we're going to post it online, so uh, it'll be available for everyone to review as well. This is a sort of high-level schedule for the budget process. Today really is the kickoff for our budget process for next fiscal year. We every year bring together our leadership in the organization, the commissioners and the department heads uh, and staff uh, across the organization to start talking about um, the challenges and opportunities that we have for the next fiscal year. So that's what today will be. It's, this is a high level conversation. So the intent is not to get into, uh, you know, departments are still doing their work um, in entering budgets. And so that will be, we'll do the department kickoff uh, next week um, where our budget staff meets with departments. Um, we provide uh, direction to departments on various things and we will share some of that towards the latter end of this presentation. Um, and then departments go to work in entering their budgets. So they'll. Uh, do work throughout uh, January, towards the end of January and February and submitting their requested budgets. Then uh, the county administrator and budget team meet with uh, our department leadership uh, in early March to review those requested budgets that departments have submitted. And then uh, we finalize the budget, uh, the proposed budget, and in late April the county administrator will propose the budget. That's the first of what we say are four steps in the budget process. County administrator proposes the budget. The budget committee approves ultimately a budget. The board of commissioner adopts the budget, um, and then uh, throughout the year we have three or four sup, um, supplemental budget uh, processes where the board amends uh, amends the budget. So the budget committee will meet uh, to consider the approval. Uh, the review and approval of the budget in early to mid-May. Um, it will then approve the budget by mid to late May, and then by mid-June, the Board of Commissioners will ultimately adopt the budget. So that's our schedule. And so we'll get in, this is gonna be real high level. I'll, I'll start, and uh, and then we have a number of, of other presenters that will talk about various topics that are outlined here on your agenda. Just to give you a, a, a big picture of where we're at, over 2,000 full-time equivalent positions. <clears throat> That's more than 2,000 bodies in the organization because uh, we have a number of, of part-time and seasonal and extra help uh, type employees. But when you look at the full-time equivalent number of employees, over 2,000 employees, 581, uh, in addition of 581 employees since fiscal year 15, 16, it's about a 30% increase in our workforce um, in the past eight years or so, so significant increase. And I think a, po a really positive story, when you look 10 years ago at um, the sheriff, you know, I was thinking, I wish I could have 
we could have bottled the sheriff's presentation from yesterday because there was so much of what the sheriff talked about um, that is foundational to these broad budget challenges and the reason that we have uh, that we've asked the voters originally in 2013 and that we continue to go back and ask for the renewal of the public safety levy because that funding is so critical for just the basic uh, services that we per that we provide here um, but it's part of this this is part of the story that we'll talk about in, in the positive story about the stability that we've been able to create over the course of the past decades since that last big cliff and and major reductions in workforce and services uh, that we had to make the the approach that we've deployed uh, in the past eight or nine years that we continue to try uh, to lead with that we'll get into here so our overall budget among all funds is approaching one billion dollars 988 million dollars among all funds and includes reserves operating and reserves and then we have 12 departments we continue to add some of these areas emergency management we used to be in the sheriff's office we pulled that out and it is its own department now um, under the leadership of patience winningham and the incredible staff across our organization we see just the the wonderful work that's happening uh, in that newer department our community uh, justice and rehabilitation services that greg rickoff is leading this year is our newest department that has brought parole and probation and youth services together and really invested in both youth family and adult um, rehabilitation and supervision uh, of folks who are cycling through the through the criminal justice system data and analytics is another newer uh, department in the county a real focus on utilizing data to um, data and analytics to help us understand the challenges that we're facing and identify opportunities to improve so uh, you the see the asterisk there. there of course we have three elected departments this is a unique aspect of counties um, counties typically have a handful of elected departments and I think one of the things that makes our organization function so well uh, that doesn't always happen in counties is that we collaborate really well uh, across all of our departments the appointed and the elected directors the board of commissioners all work together towards the common good of our organization and our community and we certainly want to see that continue so this one's a little tough to read but it's it's sort of a, a, a graphic illustration of a bit of the complexity of our budget uh, the, the county's budget overall and this pie chart shows the 32 different funds by which we manage the resources that we collect. What you see pulled out there, that, that pie slice in sort of bluish purple, is the general fund, which represents approximately 14% of the total budget in Lane County. So we oftentimes talk about the general fund, um, but we have 31 other funds. The reason we talk about the general fund is because it is historically the most constrained and it's also the, the area of most discretion. So the, so the Board of Commissioners really has broad discretion for how to spend the resources that come to the general fund. The other funds are more restricted. You can think waste management, um, our health and human services funds, um, our parole and probation fund. It's where we, we either collect state or federal revenue to deliver a specific service. The road fund is an example. A lot of state funding that comes in there, that money has to be spent on maintaining our, uh, our assets of roads and bridges across uh, the community. Um, our waste management, we charge fees, we collect those fees, and we have to spend that revenue uh, to manage that system. The general fund is the one area that the board really has broad discretion how to spend those resources where we the property tax revenue that lane county collects the approximately 11 cents on the dollar of of each property tax dollar that we collect in lane county goes to the general fund and that funds much of our core government services the sheriff's office the district attorney's office the assessor's office and other general government services the other thing that general funds tend to do in cities and counties and state governments uh, is because they are discretionary, typically general fund resources will help subsidize other parts of the organization that don't have the, the resources necessary to provide the full level of service that is really needed. Um, and so you can think about areas like our parks division. Most counties 
and cities, but I'll say definitely in, in Oregon, most counties subsidize their parks operations with uh, general fund resources. Because a park system can't charge fees high enough to really cover the true cost to maintain and build the assets a, a vibrant park system. We don't do that here in Lane County. We don't use our general fund property tax revenue to support our parks division because we don't have enough general fund to support the core services necessary. So we can't subsidize the parks, which is why uh, we went to the voters this last election and asked for a five-year levy and, and the voters supported us. And I think it goes to uh, the value that our voters and residents in Lane County place on uh, on a vibrant and healthy park system. You can look at other areas of our organization that typically in other counties are subsidized by the general fund. Those include parole and probation. Parole and probation is funded primarily by state revenue through the Community Corrections Act. That state revenue, you can look at a chart, it's significantly declined over the years. And you can ask our elected officials here and our parole and probation staff about whether or not the state has upheld its promises historically around funding for that critical service. I think you'll get a resounding no, it is not. And that's a real critical area of our public safety system that is underfunded because of the heavy reliance on state funding. Many other counties across Oregon that are similar to Lane County subsidize their parole and probation office with general funds, but we don't do that here in Lane County because we don't have the ability, we don't have the funds to do that. The other one I'll call out is land management. That is, uh, these are all funds, separate funds from the general fund that um, that are distressed, meaning they don't have enough revenue to fund the expenses, and so they're constantly looking for how do we reduce expenses or identify additional revenue and cobble together services that um, that meet some level of need in the community. Land management is another example where, um, and we've seen because of the holiday farm fire an increase of we we had to increase the staffing in that area but right now we're burning through reserves to fund that operation because in most other counties they subsidize their land management division with general funds because the fees that we charge there don't cover the full cost but we don't do that here in lane county so you see a consistent theme where um, it's not only the services the traditional services within the general fund that are underfunded it's also these other parts of the organization that aren't receiving general fund support. So we call the general fund, I, I call the general fund the mothership. It's like the health of the organization um, is really dependent on, on how well the general fund is doing. And um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, but I, I, I wanted to just also point out here, so 32 funds, keep that in mind as we talk about the budget. It's like, yeah, we'll focus a lot on general fund because that's where we have discretion to help support the other areas of the organization. And that's where underfunded, significantly underfunded for some of the core things that we do. But, but keep in mind there are 31 other funds that, that have restrictions on them, but we also need to think about how they operate and how they interact and, and coordinate and collaborate. Um, the other point I, just, I, wanna, I wanna make here on the side, you see 60% state and federal funds 40 percent local this is something unique in and we'll over when we have time we'll do some research around how this uh is for other counties in oregon but it's definitely unique for counties compared to cities 60 percent of when you look at our total budget 988 million dollars and the portion of that that is operating 60 percent of our revenue comes from the state and federal funding 40 percent comes from local taxes and so it's an important reminder that as we talk about, they're actually the, the, the majority of the resources we collect are outside of this community to provide services locally. So it's a really important reminder of how critical the relationship with the state is and the federal government, how much we rely on those fundings and the, on that funding. And in many cases, some of which I mentioned already, we really need to enhance uh, some of those areas that, that are unfunded that we rely on. Okay, so this is um, uh, another tough one to sort of, you know, not expecting you to see the detail on the slide. It's more like a, a graphical representation. I think Sheriff, you showed a slide like this yesterday, didn't you? Um, 
So you saw the SRS slide, which is the one on the right, right? This is the graphical representation of, of and I'm gonna tell this, this story that you, the sheriff, I'm sure, did a better job of telling than I did yesterday, but we'll tell it again. Why is Lane County in this situation? Why do we have so few general funds uh, to support the basic services of, of our sheriff's office and our district attorney's office, our assessor's office, and other general government services, let alone not have the resources to be able to support these other areas that traditionally are supported by the general fund? So on the left, we'll start on the left here. This, this chart with the blue bars shows you the 36 counties in Oregon and it goes uh, from small, smallest property tax rate, this is the permanent property tax rate. So every county, and these are counties, so every county has a property rate, property tax rate. It's the, this is the fixed rate um, that before 1995, I think it was, and the property tax caps went into effect, uh, the permanent rates that existed. And you see the, f I have to look at, because I don't, I can't even see that. Um, I have some glasses, but that won't help. Oh boy, this is even hard. So Josephine's at the top. Top is bad, right? Bottom is good in this context. So Josephine is at the top with the lowest rate. I, what does that say, Chris? 59 cents. All right. And then Curry, and then Coos, and then Douglas. Do you see a theme there? All timber counties, right? And then what's next? Lynn? Lynn County? Then Deschutes. So Deschutes is circled in red. And we circle in red the kind of five counties that we typically use as our comparables for a lot of things, right? The, si the population size, the, the both urban and rural components of the community. Um, so Deschutes uh, is circled, <clears throat> this is really, Jackson, Wa I mean, I know the counties, but I can't read them. Jackson, Washington, Clackamas, and Marion. So those are the ones circled there in their rates. Deschutes County has $1.28 permanent rate, same as Lane County. What this doesn't tell you is Deschutes County also has two special districts, public safety special districts. They have one that is countywide uh, for public, they're both for public safety. So they have their permanent rate of $1.28, but then they have like $1.50 something, uh, and I'll get this wrong. One is, one is countywide, so all taxpayers in the county uh, fund that, and that is for, um, for jail and district attorney services, correct? Then the other one is just within the rural components of the county and that funds the sheriff patrols. I get that right, Sheriff? Okay, basically. So the point is, Deschutes County, while they have the same permanent rate as us, they have these two separate rates that fund their entire public, well, the vast majority of their public safety system. And of course, we don't have that here. So I think if you talk to the sheriff and probably a lot of other sheriffs around Oregon, they'd say that's the <coughs> ideal model for delivering public safety services, really having a district where there's a permanent rate um, and that revenue that you can count on to build the system that you really need. So you see Lane County with the arrow right under Deschutes County at $1.28. That's the rate that we've been stuck at um, since 1995 when the caps went into effect. Um, Steve, yeah. if I may, uh, anybody watching this might be saying, well, why don't we go for a separate district? Why don't we do the same thing that Deschutes did? Yes. Uh, you, that's a rhetorical question, probably, because we've yeah. talked about it so many times, but, uh, but somebody watching this for the first time saying, well, here's the answer. Do what Deschutes did. <clears throat> yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's a question that the sheriff wants to take on. <laughs> yeah. Then I've yeah. taken a note. <laughs> Where's the gavel? <laughs> yeah. No, no need yeah, to. It's, uh, it's, well, we talked a little bit about districts yesterday as it relates to fire districts and a couple of areas in Lane County that are interested in doing that. So the process is complex, but it definitely, in terms of, I mean, I think that, I've worked with uh, three sheriffs now in this county and each of them <clears throat> talked about that as the model, as the, so I'll let the Sheriff Harold at the appropriate time today or next week, you know, address, address that issue. Um, so, but this is where we're at right now, is we have the fifth or sixth lowest permanent property tax rate of all the counties in Oregon. And, and this is a problem for timber dependent counties. The Sheriff pointed this out yesterday though, what's unique about Lane County, if you look at all of those, and let's just take the shoots out of that, really, because they are different, because they have these two other rates. You look at all the others are timber counties, but what's different? They don't have a major metro area, right, that they also serve. So we have this nearly 5,000 square, square mile geographic 
area, five, uh, 12 incorporated cities in this really large metro area, as well as the unincorporated. So huge geographic area to provide various services in, which is costly. A density of population where there are intensive services that require a lot of investment. And so, I mean, you could make an argument that Lane County is in one of the most dire financial straits of any county, just from the standpoint of these, this, this fixed position that we find ourselves in, which is why we've had to go and ask for the public safety levy and the parks and those sort of things and their shorter term measures. Um, so that's where we're, where we're at. You know, the, the SRS picture on the left, of course, again, is the story that when those caps went into effect, uh, around when those caps went into effect, around the same time, changes, or a little bit before that, changes in federal law around around policies for logging on federal lands were going into effect, and a big shift was happening there where um, the heavy reliance, we didn't need, Lane County didn't need a property tax rate that exceeded $1.28 back in the 70s and 80s because we had all of this funding, right? We were, there, was, there was a timber industry that was thriving and, and there was money that was coming to the county to help support primarily public safety and road maintenance um, and other services. So as that industry declines and the reliance on that funding, um, and this is a lesson for communities, sole reliance on individual industries, whether it's manufacturing in the Midwest or gaming uh, in Nevada, or you know, when you rely too heavily on one industry, Brian Rooney, our state economist is here and he can probably articulate this better than I could. It's a real problem because when something disrupts that industry, then you're really challenged to, um, to adjust. So this is where we're at. The, the SRS funding then came in as a, as a federal fix, a, a stopgap to say, all right, we'll provide some federal funding as an, through this entitlement program to support, um, uh, to support those services. And you can see, of course, what happens when you rely on federal funding and small number of communities in the West, really, that are SRS, uh, that have all this Forest Service land that it's relying on. It's not a big issue and it's a big issue to us. It's not a big issue in Washington, D.C. So this is where we're at, and this is why we're struggling with the challenges that we have. This is the last, uh, second to last slide that I'm gonna do. And I wanna take a minute just to talk about the approach. So you don't, if you wanna read this slide, you can. But I, what I really wanna articulate is the approach that we've taken 10 years ago in 2012. You saw this cliff, the sheriff pointed this out, the big, that big cliff that happened in 2012 with the big cut in SRS funding and the county uh, was in the position that had it laid off 200 employees. And the sheriff talked about how disruptive, not just from a service standpoint is, but the ongoing morale challenges that that hap that, of what happened in the sheriff's office. And think about that countywide for all the areas that were impacted. It's both about service delivery and then it's what it does to the culture of an organization. And I, I, there are people in this room that have been here f since 2012 and before, and they can tell you stories um, about how impactful that was. And some of that still I think reverberates today, but we've spent the better part of the last decade saying we have to get our house in order, right? There's only so much we can do with the, feder with the federal government and the state government and with our local taxes. We've got to really look. So in the past 10 years, we focused on what can we do to try to enhance revenue via public safety levy or these, you know, asking the voters and the voters have consistently supported, thankfully, um, this, this public safety levy that has been critical to us to continuing to provide uh, that critical level of public safety services in the community. And we're gonna need that going forward. <clears throat> so we've looked at the, rev what can we do within the revenue side? And we also in the last 10 years have really said, what can we do to manage our own expenses? So we've, you know, and this is what governments and, and even in the private sector, you have two sides of the, of, of, of the uh, of a budget. You've got your revenue side and you've got your expense side. That's it. I mean, balancing a budget is, is really at the end of the day, just math. One and one has to equal two uh, or close to it. But how you get to that, how you get to one and one, you know, achieving the one and one is really the question. And so we focused a lot around things like internal expenses, health insurance costs. How do we manage that expense, invest in wellness for our employees, have a long-term approach, preventative uh, care efforts, engaging with our employees and how we can attack that problem. We have a lot of great stories around that. Um, PERS, while we don't control that benefit, what are the things that we can do um, around investing in PERS side accounts to try to lower 
the increase in those obligations that are gonna to continue to grow over time. Management of our debt. How do we refinance when interest rates were lower? Uh, we tried to capture that opportunity, we did, to really <clears throat> refinance debt or prepay debt so that we could relieve the interest rate costs. So we've done these things that aren't super fun to talk about because they're kind of, you know, they're kind of wonky and boring, but they're really critical because they help us manage the, res the limited resources we have without having to cut a service and lay off an employee. And that's the approach that we want to take. So what I would say here is we've done a lot and we need to continue this effort around revenue and expense. The simple, no, I don't want to say simple, but the straight, more straightforward things around how do we enhance revenues in different areas? How do we control our expenses? And everybody has to participate in that effort. But the third level now that we need to really lean into going forward is innovation. Now this word innovation gets overused. Um, but to me what innovation means is a change to solve a problem, right? Oftentimes innovation comes as a result of failure. We try some things, we, we fail, doesn't work. We learn from that failure and we try again. Like every great innovation has come from some prior failure. Government's not really great at failure, right? We're not great at taking risks and failing because we're on the front page of the paper if we do something wrong. But now more than ever, we need to try things, do things differently. Look at that, and I'll call it a couple examples briefly. You know, waste management, I mentioned waste management earlier. And it would be very easy for our waste management division that is really a self-sustaining operation, right? It charges fees and that revenue that's collected is invested in providing a service to manage the waste in the community. So it'd be very easy for our waste management folks. And they have to think, they're thinking over 50, 100 years, right? So we, we think about how we manage that system. It'd be very easy for that operation to just think insular and like, all we have to do is manage this. We're good. We don't have to worry about general fund because we don't rely on that. Or any of other parts of the county, we have to worry about that. But if you look at what waste management or waste management division has done in the last year and is leading and leaning into, it's something it doesn't have to do. It's solving a problem. It's looking and saying, well, how could we actually become more innovative in managing the waste that we collect? We know climate change is a problem. We know that the methane gas that's created uh, from the organic waste in the landfill is a big problem. Well, waste management could easily say, well, it's not really our problem to deal with climate change and those kind of issues. But it's looking at this prob the, the problem of how do we manage our waste? How do we become more efficient? How do we do things more on the leading edge? And oh, by the way, we have a company that's lo locally is developing as manufacturing products that it is deploying internationally, except here so far, that is doing this already at scale where, where there, you know, we can process all of this waste and sort it, collect the methane gas, use that to power things, recycle uh, all the other wastes. So the goal is of course 70% diversion of waste. So think about all that trash we throw in our trash can every week, 70% of that being removed from the landfill and being diverted to, to do these other things. To me, that's innovation. That's it's not something, it's a division that's thinking much bigger than its kind of core responsibility. I'd also point out the public safety system that has been forced because of the, the limited resource, the scarcity of resources over decades to think differently. I mean, I can't go through and we're not going to, but you just recall what the sheriff talked about yesterday, the 78% of uh, uh, funding for mental health services in the jail, the, all of these innovative and creative programs that the sheriff is doing, and his team is, are doing in the jail to treat mental health services that as the sheriff indicated yesterday, have, have sort of stretched the thinking of traditional law enforcement folks because it's different than what they usually do. And if you look at how our public safety system, our DA's office is engaging and interacting with when we had state funding for, uh, um, for treatment courts that are hugely effective at dealing differently with those populations and reducing recidivism and getting people out of the cycle of criminality and into a more healthy situation. So that, that list goes on and on, but I just wanna call those out as like, this is the sort of thinking we need to bring to, yes, enhance revenue, yes, manage expenses, and also how do we think differently about all 32 funds and the areas in which we generate revenue, that are revenue centers, we have revenue centers, places we generate revenue. 
and we could generate more revenue and do other creative things. And then we have cost centers, places that cost, that we have to subsidize because we can't charge enough revenue to deliver the level of service, right? So, but we are all one. There are 32 different parts of how we manage our money, but all of those funds and these departments and divisions and services uh, that we provide are interconnected. Okay. We also have a good bond rating that's been increased a bunch and we're ranked the healthiest employer for a couple years in a row and we like talking about all the, you know, the successes. But actually I'm more interested in talking about the things that where we failed, where we're trying things and we fail and then we get back on Pagara, let's try something different, right? And we have a willingness to lean into risk um, and mistakes and understand that that's actually how we're gonna solve big challenges. This is your uh, strategic plan one pager won't go through it, but just, you know, again, part of the budget process, the strategic priorities and goals that have been identified by the board um, and that are implemented and led by our departments are critical, it really is what we use as a starting point for how we develop the budget. These are not separate documents, separate processes. It is, well, this is the work we wanna do. This is what the board has said is important to you and to the community. So this is our roadmap for how we need to think about our budget. The budget really is the, the most significant policy document that we deal with every year. And it always strikes me that very few people show up. And it's a big, there's a lot, you know, it's, people have things going on and it doesn't, people don't understand how it directly impacts uh, their day-to-day -day lives. So I understand that, but it is the most significant statement about how are we gonna take the taxpayers resources we collect locally and the 60% of the money that we collect that's outside the community, how are we gonna use that to actually drive what is most critical here in our local community that's reflective of what our community wants and the board has directed. So this is our guiding document there. Okay. I, I think we're on time. Um, I'm done and we'll invite Brian, unless there are questions on that, um, we'll invite our a state economist for Lane County, Brian Rooney, who is with us gracious every year. Come on up, Brian. Um, he'll introduce himself and talk about um, local economic status. And we just always appreciate Brian coming and joining us um, and, and really helping us in kicking off this process every year. Okay, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I guess I just keep flipping forward. Yes. Yeah. There. Yeah, and sure. does the pointer yes. work? Oh yeah. It does. Okay. Yes. I've got lots of graphs. <laughs> Gonna wanna <clears throat> point out what I'm talking about. Um, okay. So uh, my name's Brian Rooney. Uh, I work for the Oregon Employment Department, and I'm your uh, regional labor economist. Um, so. Uh, Today, we're gonna to talk about employment and unemployment trends, labor availability, housing affordability, and forecasts. We have a short-term and a long-term forecast today. So employment and unemployment during the recovery from pandemic losses. So uh, this chart shows a uh, it is a trend of uh, Lane County non-farm total employment. And you can see, you know, here's the COVID-19 pandemic recession, uh, a very steep drop in the spring of 2020. And uh, then a quick rebound, which has been slowing just a little bit lately. Uh, and you can also see by the chart that we haven't gotten back to pre-pandemic levels of employment. Uh, Lane County lost 26,600 uh, jobs or 16% of the jobs that uh, were available then between February and April of 2020. So it had gained back 23,600 of those jobs or 89% of the jobs that were lost uh, by November of 2020. Uh, in comparison, statewide, uh, Oregon lost 14%, so a little less in uh, early 2020, and it had gained back 105% of what was lost by November 2022. 
So statewide, uh, we reached pre-pandemic levels of employment in August of 2022. So this is a look at the industry level. Um, <clears throat> and this is employment coming out of the pandemic recession. So I'm comparing August 2020 to August 2022. And uh, I've also included um, 2022 uh, annual wages in there. So, you know, you can see that most industries continue to rebound from the pandemic recession. Um, some are doing particularly well. Uh, the goods producing industries, construction and manufacturing are kind of doing surprisingly well. Uh, retail trade has come back somewhat. Uh, so most industries have, uh, have rebounded from the pandemic recession. Leisure and hospitality was hurt the most by uh, the pandemic restrictions, and so it's having a very strong rebound. If we look at those wages, most industries are between 50 and 70,000 annual average wage. And uh, these are calculated uh, as total payroll divided by total employment. So it includes part-time employment. And for leisure and hospitality, reported tips are also included. So we can see that, you know, with leisure and hospitality, uh, we're adding a lot of jobs but they're also relatively low paying. So, you know, as I said, um, we've uh, only gained back 89% of the jobs that we lost in the pandemic recession. And so if we go, if we compare pre-pandemic levels to the current, we can see which industries are growing and which ones are lagging. So again, in the, in the, uh, whoops. Oops. I think Delay. Can you go back? Yep. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'll be more careful. Um, so, yeah, we can see that the uh, goods producing industries, uh, construction and manufacturing, uh, are, are well above pre-pandemic levels, they weren't affected that much by the COVID restrictions. So they didn't lose a lot of employment uh, during the COVID recession. They lost some, um, but not a whole lot. And they've continued to grow pretty well coming out of that recession. Uh, manufacturing, if we look at the subcategories, it's broad-based, uh, wood products, food products, machinery manufacturing, and uh, to some extent, transportation equipment manufacturing have all added a few hundred jobs over this time period. Some of the other industries are very close to getting back to uh, pre-pandemic levels, retail trade, um, transportation and warehousing and utilities. Uh, information is down and it's not necessarily because of uh, the pandemic recession. There's some structural things going on there. Uh, print publishing is in there, uh, media is in there, and both of those have had some job losses because of technology basically. Um, and actually, I think so the tail end of the Symantec layoffs are in there because uh, software publishing is included in information also. Um, some of the other was, well, what's lagging? This is uh, private education and health services. And in Lane County, that's almost all health services. So health services had been lagging. Um, during the pandemic and then following the pandemic, hospitals had a hard time keeping people and a hard time hiring people. You know, just very stressful, uh, maybe asked to do too much, or maybe that's the way uh, employees felt at the time. That's getting a little better at hospitals. But uh, more recently, um, residential care facilities have been competing uh, for low wage uh, workers. So they're competing with leisure and hospitality and retail and those industries have raised their wages to get employees. So at, uh, at uh, residential care facilities, we've been seeing some lag in employment returning. That might be getting better more recently. And then we can see leisure and hospitality as a short way to go to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Government, um, that lag is mostly public school districts. And uh, so we went to virtual learning. Uh, the salaried people pretty much stayed on. But uh, the wage earners, uh, especially bus drivers and substitute teachers, you know, they lost a job. And a lot of those people went on to other industries, found jobs elsewhere. And 
And so that's where it's been difficult for public schools to get back to, uh, to uh, pre-pandemic levels. It's, a lot of it's been bus drivers and substitute teachers. And uh, that may be getting a little better recently also. Mr. Rooney? Yeah. Um, occasionally there may be questions from the board. I'll only interrupt if there is a, an, an immediate question. And uh, Vice Chair Trigger has a question. Yeah, Thank sure. you, Chair. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. It's always good information. Do you have, um, at another time, perhaps, any uh, breakdown of demographic information? I know these industries are very gendered in terms of who is in these jobs. Yeah. And so we're missing a lot of really important information, a lot of the underlying structural problems, for instance, around child care and other caregiving, is a lot of why the industries that we're seeing huge lags in, which are predominantly women in that workforce, um, I think there's some contextual and systemic issues that, um, that this graph really lights up if you're thinking about that. Yeah. So at some point, I would really appreciate some demographic, particularly around gender, but not exclusively uh, around I, these different industries. I can say in general that healthcare and education in particular um, are a female dominated, or largely female. Um, and yeah, healthcare is a huge issue, getting people back to work after the pandemic. Thank you. And Mr. Rooney, to tag on that, um, childcare needs a triple underline because of the impact it has on virtually every segment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's been a problem before the uh, pandemic recession and the pandemic recession exacerbated the shortage of child care. It's, it's the work that makes all other work possible. Right, right. Yeah, it frees up people to work. Okay, okay unemployment rates. So, you know, uh, we had unemployment rates uh, skyrocket in early 2020. And uh, then with that rebound in employment, we saw unemployment rates drop very rapidly down to near record levels. Um, just recently, Oregon and Lane County have seen unemployment rates tick up over the past few months. Um, in November, Lane County's unemployment rate was 4.6%. Um, it's about the same as a year ago at 4.5%. And even though it's ticked up a little bit, uh, these are historically low unemployment rates. They're very low at this point. We could consider it full employment. Um, and this all comes down from a high of 14% in November 2021. Um, Oregon's uh, statewide rate was 4.4% in November, so we're tracking very well with the statewide rate. Uh, the U.S. unemployment rate was 3.7% in November. It just came out. It, uh, it ticked down to 3.5%, which uh, matches a record low unemployment rate for, for the nation. So uh, still very low unemployment rates and uh, still a tight labor market. Okay, this uh, compares, this is November unemployment rates by county, and it kind of is a ranking. Um, Post-pandemic, it was kind of interesting, uh, you know, traditionally the urban areas have lower unemployment rates while rural areas in eastern and uh, southwestern Oregon have higher rates. Um, after the pandemic, we saw urban areas and, and the Willamette Valley uh, get more restrictions. And so for a little while, the urban areas had higher unemployment rates and the rural areas had lower unemployment rates. Yeah, we can see we're starting to get back to that kind of more traditional ranking statewide. And pardon my interruption, Mr. Rooney. Um, is there an ambient rate? You know, right now, everybody's looking for, for staff. So there's no reason to have any unemployment yeah. because uh, there are lots of jobs out there. What is the ambient rate that just never really don't dip below? Is there such a thing? Um, you know, we're hitting down around 4% for our area. That's probably as low. I mean, that's very near a record low. Um, and we're seeing record low national record lows nationally. There's always going to be some churn in the economy. There's always going to be some little bit of unemployment. People leave jobs. Um, people still get laid off, even though the unemployment <coughs> rate's very low. So there's always some churn there. So there's always going to be a little bit of unemployment, but it's hard to imagine it, you know, getting much lower than we've seen in recent years. Thank you for that. I think that comes close to answering my question. There's a common perception that some people simply don't want to work. They won't take any job that is offered to them. And uh, you don't need to res respond to that. I think that's just a common perception. I think there's probably some truth to that. Yeah, sure. Uh, right. Everybody's different. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in November, Grant County had uh, Oregon's highest unemployment rate at 6.4%. Wheeler County had the lowest at 3%, and 
And I'm not sure what's going on in Wayne County. <laughs> They've had some employment growth there, and it's a very uh, low population county. So when you have employment growth in a low population county, they get very low unemployment rates. So it's still a tight labor market. Um, this time last year, we were talking about a tight labor market, and, and it still is. But it may be improving somewhat as far as vacancies go. Um, so uh, vacancies may be showing the first signs of returning to a lower level. Um, uh, first of all, these vacancies are private sector only. So we know that there are some public sector vacancies also. Uh, but uh, the, the most recent uh, private sector vacancy uh, survey was in the summer of 2022, and it's down 16% compared to the summer of 2021. And uh, that makes roughly 1.3 vacancies per unemployed person. So there's more vacancies than there are unemployed people. Still a tight labor market. Um, and But that's about the same as the summer of 2021. We have less unemployed people now than we did in the summer of 2021. Uh, but it looks like some of those vacancies are getting filled. We saw the unemployment rate has ticked up some since the summer of 2022. So we may be seeing some signs that this really tight labor market is loosening up a little bit. Uh, this is statewide uh, industry level data from the summer of 2022 vacancies. And basically it just shows that uh, the, uh, the shortage of uh, labor, the vacancies is very broad based on an industry level. Uh, healthcare and social assistance uh, usually leads the way. There's a lot of demand for health care and social assistance, for that matter, uh, for those jobs. Um, leisure and hospitality, a very large industry that's uh, got a lot of churn and still looking for people. And same with retail trade. One thing that's a little surprising is construction and manufacturing. Um, traditionally, they're a little lower on the list when we're ranking industries by vacancies. Um, so, you know, we're seeing a lot of demand for construction and manufacturing workers statewide. And just basically, uh, all industries have an elevated level of vacancies. You know, even down here, re natural resources and mining is basically logging. Um, there are quite a few vacancies. And again, this is private sector vacancies. There was one missing here about... Uh, labor shortage going forward, and it has to do with retirements. Um, retirements have been increasing as a reason that people aren't in the labor force. Um, I think it was between 2016 and 2019, uh, the level of retirements as a reason for not being in the labor force went up 21%. And so we're at a very high level of uh, people who are not in the labor force because of retirement. Um, so, it, you know, retirements have restricted labor supply before the pandemic, during the pandemic and will restrict labor supply uh, for years to come, decades. Yeah, at least one decade. So housing affordability um, has been a problem lately. Uh, this is kind of an interesting um, analysis done by the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis. Uh, they do the, uh, the revenue forecast. Um, so what this is, is uh, home ownership affordability. And it's measured as uh, the Lane County households who can afford the median sold home with 5% down payment and uh, total housing costs not exceeding 30% of income. So, you know, on the West Coast, this has been a problem for a while. Um, but over the past year, it's uh, been exacerbated. We've seen... Uh, the housing sale prices uh, rise rapidly uh, early in 2022, and now we're getting interest rate increases, uh, so mortgage rates are going up. So both of those things combined to bring down affordability. So 36% of households in Lane County could afford to buy a house uh, a year ago. Today, it's down to 20, 20%. Mr. Rooney? A yeah. Question from, uh, from the I think your statement just clarified it because uh, I... I read this when it came out, so we get the updates from um, the office yeah. it, as they come out. And when I noticed this, you know, I instantly knew that only 20% of the people that live in Lane County can afford to uh, 
bought in this sense, I think it was buy a house. Yeah, this is buy a house. In yeah. our area, which is completely astounding. And, you know, that it's actually quite devastating to hear that. Yeah, and you know, we're starting out from a low point on the West Coast. Home ownership affordability has been pretty bad for several years. Um, some areas of the country, you know, home, home ownership affordability is up around 60, 65%. Um, so we're starting at this low point and it's become uh, even, uh, it's, it's gone down uh, quite a bit. So that 20% is very low as far as home ownership affordability. So um, when people can't afford a house, afford to buy a house, they have to rent. And that has put demand on uh, rental units. So you know we could see here. I believe this is early 2021, um, and then this is late 2022. And this state is seasonal, so it goes up in the summer, comes down a little bit in the winter. But these increases that we've had the past springs, spring and summers um, have been way beyond anything we've seen recently. Um, over the past two year, uh, over the past two years, this uh, rental uh, cost index is up 25 percent over the past two years. So um, you know, without uh, home ownership affordability, we put demand on rental units, and uh, rents are going up. Um, Mr. Coles, thank you. Uh, just a quick question regarding uh, the new laws uh, regarding uh, rent increases. Has that impacted affordability? You know, I was looking at that, and during, like, the pandemic, they had uh, foreclosure forgiveness. Um, it, <laughs> looking at this graph, it hasn't uh, really affected affordability that much. Um, you know, we're seeing... Recently, this is largely a seasonal decline. Nationally, we're seeing rents maybe coming down a little bit over the past few months. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to wait to see how that comes out. Yeah. Do you have the vacancy rate for rental housing in Lake? I don't have that handy. I can get that. I'm just wondering, I mean, rents keep going up and going up. They're still full. <coughs> People well, are paying those rents. A yeah. supply is a certain certainly an issue. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And this next graph touches on that. Yeah. Mr. Rooney, one more question from uh, Commissioner Laval. Well, yeah. I made, made a question. I maybe just a, just a challenge on that from a landlord's point of view. I think the the new laws that came into effect two years ago that were exacerbating the relationship between landlord and tenant, and then the increases that Mr. Cowles was talking about twenty five point what six percent in two years. Landlords were trying to recover a lot of the leverage they felt they lost. So I think those increases that you um, uh, looked at are a direct result of that, um, in my opinion, bad legislation to the relationship of landlord and tenants. Yeah, yeah, then that's, that's uh, that, that would make sense. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> uh, Buck. In, there were also a lot of legislation that went into effect in order to keep people in homes during that time due to COVID. Yeah. So there is a countering effect. But because they're both happening at the same time, I think it's hard to weed out at, at certain levels. Right, right. Um, and it's liable that they had that effect, plus the increased demand because housing affordability is down. And Ms. Rooney, you won't get as many interruptions on all of your slides, but housing is of particular importance yeah, to everybody I, I sitting around. That. <laughs> I know it's a, kind of a hot button issue. Warned him. <laughs> I almost skipped it. <laughs> we have five more in the queue. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've got my contact information also. Um, so uh, there may be some help on the way, though. Uh, building permits are up in recent years. Um, so it takes about uh, 1,400 units to keep, to keep up with population growth, um, and that's just the average population growth over the past 10 years. Um, and we've been doing that for the past four out of five years. We've been meeting that 1,400 or exceeding it. Um, I will say here in 2021, um, some of the, uh, the recovery from fire up in the McKenzie Valley has helped to boost those uh, single family units and help boost the, uh, the con actually the construction employment and the uh, building permits that year. Um, for this year, 2022, that's only uh, year-to-date through November, so that'll likely tick up a little bit more. 
So, you know, we're increasing supply a little better than we were back here. Um, we were really underbuilding uh, for several years. And so those building rate, uh, building permit levels have come up. Okay, we've got two forecasts. The short-term forecast is from uh, the Oregon um, the, uh, Department of uh, Economic Analysis, and they do the revenue forecast and they do short-term forecasting. Uh, they now have a mild recession in their forecast for 2023. So uh, Oregon employment is expected to uh, lose about 24,000 jobs or 1.2% on net uh, over about a year period. So just looking at the graph here, we start losing jobs in early to mid-2023, losing jobs through 2023, um, and start gaining them back in 2024 and gain them all back uh, during 2024. This is Oregon statewide. Um, it's expected to be a mild recession, similar to 1990 downturn. Um, so uh, there are several reasons that they're expecting it to be mild. Uh, first of all, inflation is moderating. Um, July through November of 2022, inflation is only 1%. Uh, if we can keep up that pace uh, for you know, the next six or seven months, we're getting down to that uh, 2% inflation rate that the Federal Reserve likes to see. There are a lot of risks to that, but we're definitely on a um, inflation moderating trend, and the new inflation numbers come out tomorrow for December. Supply chains have been improving. Um, you know, just uh, the logistics software and the handling of logistics has improved. Um, we're moving uh, more material. Queues at ports are down. Um, so supply chains, you know, are still uh, are, are still slow, and we're we're still have some supply problems with things like petroleum and, and grain, uh, but supply chains have been improving and that's been helping the inflation rate. Um, so this would be a mild uh, recession because uh, businesses you know, see these things happening. They know that interest rates will eventually come down. Federal Reserve has said they're not gonna lower interest rates this year, but they have also indicated that they're not likely to have the large you know, 0.75% or percentage point increases. Um, so we're probably going to see uh, the increase in interest rates moderate. Um, and also we're coming through this period of a tight labor market. So even if things turn down, uh, employers having come through this tight labor market are probably going to be less likely to let people go easily. Um, so there are some reasons that we're expecting this mild recession in 2023. This is long-term forecast from the employment department. Um, so uh, it starts 2020 and goes out to 2030. And we're starting in a recession year. So the industries that were hurt most by COVID restrictions are expected to have the strongest rebound. Um, Lane County is expected to add about 15%, uh, which is pretty strong growth. Uh, if you go year to year, 1.5%, that would be very strong growth over a 10 year period. Uh, so le leisure and hospitality adds the most jobs. Um, private education and health services, that health services uh, was hurt somewhat during the pandemic. And uh, there's just a lot of demand uh, for health care going forward. So that's uh, a lot of jobs there. Uh, professional and business services, a very broad category. Some of the industries there, um, like uh, temporary help and uh, um, call centers, but also some of the professional uh, industries like uh, architecture and engineering uh, were hurt during the pandemic. It's a very large industry, so it adds a, a decent number of jobs coming out. Um, and there we have total employment. Uh, state government is boosted by uh, the expansion at the uh, State Hospital in Junction City. Uh, I think they added a little over 100 jobs uh, uh, over the past couple of years. So uh, bottom line here is that most industries are expected to uh, rebound and, and add jobs going forward. Uh, Oregon statewide is expected to increase by 16%, so just a little faster than Lane County. And then some other areas that are expected to grow faster, uh, Central Oregon, 
they have a lot of leisure and hospitality plus a lot of population growth. They're expected to grow 18%. The Portland area, 17%. And then Northwest Oregon, uh, very dependent on leisure and hospitality jobs. So they have a little <coughs> faster uh, recovery. And then finally, this is um, the forecast by broad occupational category. And so these gold bars are the net growth. So that's like we saw on the previous chart, uh, net growth over the 10-year period. And so we have growth openings, and that's the gold bar bars. And then uh, we have the blue bars, which are exits. And that's when somebody creates an opening by leaving, leaving the labor force. And that's largely retirements going forward. And then the green bars are transfers. And that's when somebody stays in the labor force and uh, moves to a different occupation and creates an opening that way. A lot of that's advancement, and that's related to retirements also. So, but the bottom line here is that going forward, there's a lot of opportunity for people in all industries. <coughs> Uh, if they get the right training um, and uh, have good soft skills, training and education and soft skills, there's a lot of opportunity in all industries going forward. So uh, I think we have time for questions, comments. Thank you, Mr. Rooney, for the presentation. Looking around the room for a cue. Um, uh, to, to spark things off, uh, as we look at the, the job growth, we don't talk very much about what the uh, average wage in those jobs are. And we would consider labor and, excuse me, uh, le uh, leisure and, uh, and you know, the, uh, the hospitality industry as being relatively low paid jobs, quite often maybe part time jobs and non not full benefited jobs. So uh, that takes into account, you know, the affordability for every single other aspect of the things that people need, including childcare, including home ownership or rental. So, yeah. so uh, Vice Chair. Yeah, I would just thank you for saying that, and I would just amplify also no retirement benefits. So that's part of the perpetuation of the, of the problem, just mm -hmm. pointing that out too. It's not just about this week, what's my paycheck and what are my bills. Yeah. <laughs> the April. I just read somebody put out a publish that Oregon was one of the states that's actually losing population. How does that impact the rest of this? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, so the Portland State University um, does an estimate of population growth, and they were slightly positive. The Census Bureau, U.S. Census Bureau, also puts out an estimate of population growth in Oregon, and they were slightly negative. Um, the bottom line there is <coughs> population growth is slowing in Oregon. I mean, there's a little bit of a difference there but it's just been slowing over the past few years. And uh, Oregon basically grows its population through in-migration. Um, the natural increase is, is negative. We have more deaths than we have births. So we rely on net migration to grow our population and grow our workforce. So uh, it, we can't say, we can't really say how things are gonna be going forward right now. Uh, the forecast is for population growth to improve coming out of the pandemic. It hasn't done that so far, and it could slow uh, economic growth going forward. Uh, I'm looking for the cube, but I have a question in the meantime, Ms. Rooney. The, uh, and once again, you may not have the answer, it may be uh, in the air rhetorical question. Uh, each year, Eugene High Schools. When you graduate from high school, you want to leave home, right? You want to go live on your own? Typically, you go to college, you go live on your own. Sometimes you stay home. Um, but in increasingly, more numbers of people do stay home. But um, about somewhere over 2,000 kids graduate from, Lane, from Eugene high schools alone every year. We're presuming that uh, some of those are going to lo be looking for housing locally. Uh, you say that the, the population growth, the demand is about 1,400 a year for new houses. But we have 2,000 kids graduating alone. Um, so, and we also have the in-migration, the growth. How do you factor graduation rates? Uh, is there a factor that's thrown in on that? Because there is a demand on both the job market and on, uh, on rentals and, and home ownership. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> not to be morbid, but people die and leave space. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, um, so there is that. Um, and we're seeing the population grow slow, although it's expected to increase going forward. Um, when I did that analysis, it was just net population growth over a 10-year period averaged 
to you know a single year, um, and then divided by the size of households, which I believe is 2.4 percent in Wayne County. So it's like average of 3,000 net population growth divided by 2.4 percent size of the household to get that 1,400 units. So, so I can yeah, rest comfortably it, it, that uh, graduation rates are factored into that. To no, no, population. it's just net population growth. Net population. Okay. All right. So that doesn't really uh, account for the yeah. men on front doors. Right, right. They're, the that's kind of churned within that net number. So we continually fall behind on the number of front doors we uh, produce. Um, and, and, you know, that's an observation. I, the fact is, try to find a rental right now. Try to find a two-bedroom apartment right now, and if you do find one, try to find one for under fifteen hundred bucks a month, which is more than most people around this table's mortgage. <laughs> right, right, and you would expect um, household sizes to increase a little bit as mm -hmm. people, more people, yeah, live in a in a in a unit. But it's all a part of the broader discussion that we need to have on an ongoing basis, and and we're all attuned to it. The fact that we don't have enough houses for people to live in which uh, causes people to live together, which is a good thing. You know, people live together in, in, in clusters. But it also, uh, there, is a, there is a distinct effect on the people who simply cannot afford a home or who are evicted because of non-payment of rent, because they can't afford the payment of the rent. Or um, there's an arbitrary increase in, the, it's not an arbitrary increase, but a, a legal and factored, it, factored in increase in rent that causes people to not allow, be able to afford the home, the homes. Yeah. We have a real problem in Lane County, and uh, it's exacerbated in, in, for instance, our DA's department. Um, the DA continually loses uh, district attorneys to higher paying jobs quite often, uh, often the state, but when we're trying to attract a professional into Lane County from another area, uh, such as a, a, a DA2 or a DA3 or you know a, a seasoned DA, they can't afford to sell their home there, buy a home here, and, uh, and make the move. Yeah, yeah, housing costs can limit in migration, um, and that may be what's happening recently. Thank you. Just one more comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just let's not forget the cost of building these days. cost of building nowadays is approaching $375 a square foot, which we've never had before. Obviously, Bend has had that square footage price for a while, but people migrate there are willing to pay that. But Lane County, we don't have the, the salaries and the job market to pay for that, but that doesn't make the costs go down. So there's a, that double-edged sword there as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Just uh, anecdotally, you know, in, uh, in 20 years ago, a two by four, eight foot was 99 cents. And if you charge more than 99 cents, people weren't gonna buy it. <laughs> well, they're up around five bucks now, you know, so that's a 500% increase. That's, that's why you measure twice and cut. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> He's a carpenter too. <laughs> Multifaceted. Okay. That's it, thank Good. you. Thank I, you. I see okay. no one else in the queue. Thank you, Ms. Right. Bruning. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. And we'll uh, invite Alex Kyler, our Legislative Affairs Manager and Steve Adams, our Policy Director here to lead us in a discussion about um, state legislative update. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alex Kyler. I'm the county's intergovernmental relations manager. I'm going to run through a few slides. Uh, these are be f somewhat familiar to um, past leadership um, uh, meetings, but um, I'm going to just go ahead and jump into it here. So the context that we find ourselves in is, um, you know, of, of Lane County is both an urban and a rural county. I'm just going to do a couple of highlights on each of these. Um, recently, the uh, Census Bureau has changed the definition of urban, so it went from 25 to 5,000. And the way they they don't really define rural, but it has increased as a result. It's now really increased what is. Um, uh, available as a rural. And sorry, I, I meant to say it's gone down from the definition of urban has uh, 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 gone down from 5,000 to 2,500. Other, in other words, we may have more emphasis on rural resources, particularly in the, in the federal government as a result. Um, we do, you know, Lane County does have sort of these dueling priorities of um, 
uh, urban communities versus rural communities. So it makes us a very interesting county in terms of the work that I do in both uh, with Congress and the Oregon legislature. Uh, obviously, um, the pandemic and the wildfire have really impacted um, uh, a lot of policy over the last couple of years. Notably, the uh, state made for the first time a Department of Emergency Management. Uh, as did the county, and so we've got a whole new suite of issues and trying to really figure out, okay, how do we, how do we elevate that? Uh, those of you who have been watching, you saw uh, yesterday Governor Kotek issued um, an emergency order on homelessness, and notably she put the Department of Emergency Management in a leadership role in that. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic that we're seeing play out right now. Uh, we've got a new congressman, Val Hoyle, in the 4th Congressional District. So we've gone from a very senior member to uh, a, a freshman, if you will. Uh, fresh woman, I guess, what was the term we use? A, a frosh. A frosh, okay, I like that. Um, and so uh, uh, obviously uh, Congresswoman Hoyle has a lot of experience in our state and in our region, and we really look forward to working with her uh, as, as her career evolves in Congress. Um, we're really hoping that she does land a seat on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, many of Congressman DeFazio's previous staff have migrated over to that committee or have stayed in uh, the office of Congressman Woman Hoyle, including um, uh, Dan uh, Whalen, who's his, uh, her district director, was for Congressman uh, DeFazio and will remain on with Congresswoman Hoyle. So um, some consistency there. We've got a lot of new members in the Oregon legislature and including at leadership. So a relatively new Speaker of the House, Dan Rayfield from Benton County, and a brand new Speaker of the House, Senator Rob Wagner from uh, Lake Oswego. So uh, a lot of changes, not only in the membership at large, but also in how uh, leadership is, is formatted in Salem. And leadership has a lot of power uh, in the building, so we'll we'll see how that uh, plays out after the long term. Uh, one of the longest running uh, uh, senators, Peter Courtney, has retired, making now uh, Floyd Przanski of uh, Eugene the, the uh, most senior member in the Oregon legislature. Um, a lot of changes at uh, the governor's office. Um, uh, she's still populating uh, her staff, and then changes at the executive branch as well. So we're seeing some agency heads either. Um, be removed from those positions against their will or voluntarily uh, retiring or leaving uh, service. And so um, we're going to see uh, a lot of new changes and, and perhaps some reformulations of how those, uh, of those offices are, are arranged. And then internally, we've got a new policy team framework led by Steve Adams. And um, so that gives uh, a lot more resource to the work. Um, interestingly, I think the work was really already there, and we were just, but we've done a much better job, I think, of wrapping a framework around it. So we do do an enormous amount of work with partners like the National Association of Counties and the Association of Oregon Counties, and there are others. A lot of, um, you, you know, the individual departments and the, and the employees here are part of professional associations that do a lot of advocacy work. And so those, um, those associations are, are, are too numerous to list, but there are a number of those associations that uh, I work with in both Salem and Washington, D.C. To, to move initiatives forward. And then just uh, the obvious is that gaining policy reform and funding often requires multiple years. Um, I think the emergency management is a good example of that. Um, the the uh, commissioners who have been here for a while know we've, we've been pushing a risk issue for a number of years in Salem. Um, and so these things can really take some time to educate people about and finally sort of get the language right. And I think I just want to speak briefly to, to Administrator Moker Heifsey's statement about innovation. And so a lot of what we do is really try to anticipate um, where we might be able to help with getting either the proper policy or the funding in place. Um, and so some good examples of that, uh, the uh, multipurpose stadium uh, funding that we were able to secure, the courthouse funding we were able to secure. I think the risk is that you know we, we, we can secure funding and then if we don't deliver, we can find ourselves in sort of an awkward situation with respect to um, the, the sort of you know stage we set in these in these forums. So it's uh, it's uh, 
it's, it's our job to really try to, to make sure, because a lot of these funding things take a lot of time. The sheriff's office, um, we, got a, we got some congressionally di directed spending two years ago that it took um, multiple months to actually finally get leverage the resources loose from the federal agency that was mandated to provide it. And so these things can take an enormous amount of time to actually have the dollars land here. Um, moving on here to the legislature. So we will um, be starting not in February 2023, but in January 2023. Uh, in fact, on Tuesday, the session will really start to get underway. Um, we don't, we're, we're sort of challenged this year because the Capitol is going through an enormous construction project. And um, so we, we'll, we will see an in-person environment and virtual environment uh, is the plan at the moment. And um, that, that will be a challenge, I think. We do have a sort of a mixed reputation in Salem. It's, it's interesting to see in Congress, um, Congress really likes its mayors. But in, 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 in the legislature, uh, counties are really partners in service delivery. And so we have a little bit, we do a lot of service delivery for the state. And so we have a, a, a little bit more, uh, I would say a little bit more clout than cities in Salem, um, countered against how we find ourselves um, when we go out to, to, to Washington, D.C. We do have a really well-positioned uh, delegation, although not nearly the numbers that Multnomah County, for example, has. Um, but we do have uh, uh, Senator Przanski, chair of judiciary, for example, Nancy Nathanson, chair of house revenue, uh, Paul Holvey, chair of business and labor, and has a seat on joint ways and means. So we really we do have some powerful people down here, and uh, that makes that makes our job a little bit easier, I think. Um, we do, we do work both policy and um, fiscal issues, and um, particularly the Ways and Means process has been pretty good to us over the last couple of years where we've been able to leverage quite a bit of resources uh, for both COVID and, and wildfire. Um, we've got an interesting dynamic where some of the federal resources um, that, that we've seen over the last couple of years may be repurposed early in this session. And um, I just caught that I said the rebalance bill is an early budget bill, which it is, and can influence Lane County's FY24 budget. It actually could influence F FY23, right? It's, it's, the, it's the final bill of this biennium that they'll tune up. And the other thing about the governor's EO yesterday, she talks about $130 million of resource. That will actually have to be repurposed by the legislature and likely in that early budget bill. So it'll be something that can be spent right now before the biennium closes out on July 1st. So it, it could have some influences on our existing budget year. A couple of important acronyms I think you should be watching for. Community Correction, I'll just list them. Community Corrections Act, that's the funding that Administrator Mokreisky talked about and is so important to the sheriff and to, to Mr. Rickoff in terms of their uh, respective works. JRI, again, is closely tied to uh, Community Corrections Act is Justice Reinvestment Initiative. Um, CMHP is a community mental health program. Uh, they get funding through something called the County Financial Assistance Agreement, CFAA. So that's another one that um, you'll probably see quite a bit about. CAFA is uh, assessor of Vukulich's uh, uh, important measure and is going to be the focus of some, some um, legislation this year. It's the county uh, assessment Function Financial Assistance Grant out of the Department of Revenue. Um, SHAP is uh, a money for homelessness, and ARPA, of course, is the American Rescue Plan Act. Again, we may see a bunch of dollars that were allocated for ARPA projects that have strict timelines by the um, uh, United States Treasury get into the rebalance bill because they're going to be really forced to get out the, the, the door. And it, it may be that some of those projects in which there were hundreds are just not being evolved as, as people might have expected. So uh, finally, I think here is going to be a much different governor's office than Governor Brown's office, particularly inside the four walls of the Capitol. Um, and so that's going to be something fascinating to watch. Obviously, former Speaker Kotek, now governor, has um, a huge wealth of knowledge about how the legislature operates. Okay, um, moving on to the Congress. Um, 
the uh, fiscal year 23 uh, budget was um, was signed by, um, on uh, December 23rd. We actually did have a couple of nice uh, um, congressionally directed spending pieces in that measure, uh, a million and a half for the Behavioral Health Stabilization Center, a million and a half for an immediate occupancy standard at the multipurpose um, facility, and about $150,000 for consoles downstairs at the uh, Sheriff's Dispatch Center. So we will be um, looking to know how to, to queue that up for uh, next year's budget. Um, we think that uh, the, both the House and the Senate have agreed that those that kind of uh, directed spending will continue. Uh, obviously, as we've seen over the last couple of days, um, it, the, the big question mark will be the functionality in the House, and uh, particularly when it comes to things like the debt ceiling and the budget bill. So uh, those are those may be not quite in the same timelines that have already been traditionally delayed. Um, you know the the budget the budget bill really should have been signed before uh, September 30th, and and the last couple of years it's been in late December. So not the the sort of prognostication for next year is really uncertain about what the timing of a budget will actually be. Um, let's see. I think that's it. So I'll look around the table for a queue for questions for Mr. Kyler. I guess you are really thorough, Alex, and you have a legislative committee meeting tomorrow, I believe. I do, and I, d I did want to just say, you know, we we uh, we'll really be tuning up our final priorities tomorrow. But uh, when we convened in late summer, we were actually also given a couple. Of we formalized a couple of legislative priorities in front of the board. Those did lead to pre-session filed bills, so we're we're in the queue with a couple bills already. There were a thousand bills that were dropped or printed um, earlier this week, and we're waiting through those measures. We'll probably get another two thousand bills uh, as the session evolves. So, you know, we used to get those, all of those in paper. Yeah. Form. And uh, do you remember those file cabinets that I used to have in my office? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> those aren't there anymore, fortunately. Uh, I have a, a quick question for you. This is more rhetorical. How many members of the Oregon legislature are neither Republican nor Democrat? I know the answer. I don't think we have anybody who, like in Congress, will declare independence and, and caucus with one another. Mm -hmm. So we have zero that aren't Democrat or Republican, and close to that in Congress also. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, I want to introduce our next speaker as well because you may not know this person. <laughs> uh, Mike Coles was our former assessor. He retired for a week and then decided retirement was not for him. So he's back. And let this be a lesson to anyone who thinks they're going to be happier in retirement or <laughs> working for some other organization for that matter, uh, you won't. Uh, but I seriously, because I didn't get to, a chance to say this uh, at Mike's uh, farewell, I, I wanted to just comment on Mike has come back and is serving as the deputy assessor. This is a position that uh, Mike requested and we worked with a couple of years ago as Mike w knew that he was gonna retire, or was planning that, um, and, and wanted to uh, build a workforce plan, right, for leadership. I'm calling this out, because, one, to credit Mike, but also as a lesson to all of us that, you know, as we're building leadership in the organization and setting up the organization for smooth transition, uh, an opportunity for, for leadership development, I think the way that Mike went about this was really critical. Creating this temporary position that he's now come back as to serve as the deputy assessor under Mary Vooks at Schaefer, who is the uh, duly elected assessor in Lane County and was sworn in um, on Monday. So Mike is serving in that effort, but I just really appreciate um, the, the intention that Mike and his team have taken in that transition and our organization, our community are better off for it. I'll note that Mary Vuxit Schaefer was a graduate of our Emerging Leaders Program. The intention of that Emerging Leaders Program is to uh, help individuals who are interested in leadership opportunity to gain some skills before they've actually moved into a supervisory management position. So Mary went through that. She's, I think, was in the first cohort of, of our Emerging Leaders uh, program and is now our elected assessor. So some great successes there. So anyways, thanks, Mike. For Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Steve. Um, and we're in good hands with Mary, so I'm really happy about that transition. And so I'm going to uh, talk briefly about the Oregon property tax system, uh, specifically in Lane County, and, and more of some of the generalities. Um, taxing districts. Uh, the assessor's office collects for 85 taxing districts, including the incorporated cities, school districts, fire districts, and other uh, miscellaneous districts. Um, it's one note that I always like to point out that uh, even though we do collect for these uh, 84 other districts, Lane County does not receive any funding from these districts for doing the collection activities as part of our statutory requirements. Um, one component uh, that uh, Mary is working on with Representative Nathanson and Alex touched on is potentially a bill regarding a uh, small holdback from the taxing districts to help fund uh, the county. So we'll see how, where that goes this upcoming year. Uh, some quick facts about what we collect and the dollar amounts. Uh, the predominant um, properties that we collect for are residential and track, track properties at 50, roughly 54, 55%, commercial about 10%, uh, industrial about six, Six and a half percent, uh, farm forest, multifamily, and then personal property, utilities, and other bring up the lower amount. I, the main reason why I like to show this chart is the exempt properties. The exempt are 16.6 percent of our assessed value. Those are properties such as uh, churches, schools, uh, religious organizations, uh, other uh, exempt entities that do not pay property taxes currently in the system. Um, we have roughly 182,000 accounts and growing. Uh, our real market value this past year was right around $88 billion countywide. Uh, the taxable value uh, was right around $40 billion. Uh, we certified roughly uh, $662 billion, or million dollars, uh, for all the taxing districts. And we collected roughly 195,000 property tax payments. and. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we did bring the property tax payment uh, handling for our lockbox in-house, so we do, do do that in-house now, uh, which is a, a nice uh, uh, local employment measure as far as, and also we can process those a lot uh, fish, more efficiently and more cost-effective. Uh, we had approximately uh, a little over 5,000 uh, property inspections, uh, mostly from sales, building permits, and other uh, hot spot appraisal work. Uh, we used to be on a six-year appraisal cycle uh, years ago, but with measure uh, 47 and 50, uh, we, uh, the legislature took that piece out as far as that six-year cycle. So now we are fairly behind in our cyclical re reappraisal, but we do recalculation for most of the accounts, except for commercial industrial, which are those are traditionally trended accounts. Um, we had approximately 15 thousand ownership changes the prior year and 2700 property boundary changes including partition plats lot line adjustments and lot validations uh, that's a lot of work for our office to do and uh, our, our staff has stayed uh, fairly consistent since we had uh, fairly uh, significant layoffs in 2012 and 13 um, we also have roughly about 20,000 public information contacts per year, which includes email, uh, phone calls, in person, and uh, we also have a very large web presence uh, where we have a lot of information available on our website for uh, businesses and also for <coughs> taxing districts and taxpayers to use. Uh, the 2022-23 market, and so just keep in mind that we are always using the prior year's data uh, to calculate our values and our assessment date for this data was January 1st, 2022. We're looking at data for January 1st, 2023 right now as we just finished that uh, sales year. Uh, this prior year, the typical Lane County home saw about a 14% increase in the market value. Um, and again, the current tax statement shows the market value as of January 1st. Uh, any changes after that will be reflected in next year's property tax statements. Uh, and the property 
taxable value is a lower of the Measure 50 assessed value minus any exemptions. Exemptions could be a veteran's exemption or it could be an exemption based on uh, other uh, criteria. Um, we also uh, currently properties pay about 53% of their market value is their assessed value for typical residential properties. So where that comes into play is where if the market starts taking a downturn, uh, it actually helps the budget out in, in some aspects that we don't see a dollar for dollar reduction in property taxes or assessed value. Uh, so we do have a little bit of leeway there if the, if the market does crash. Uh, but I'll show you some slides in a second where uh, we've seen the market going. Um, let's see here. Uh, typical residential dwelling, uh, you can see in the chart here, I think there's a laser on here. Uh, you can see where we had the run up previously in 2007 and six. And you can see the plateauing and then the uh, recession uh, dropping down. You can see where we're at right now. We're way up here compared to where we were last time where we had the drop in values. Um, the, the market's really strange right now and is where this is the mar uh, same data but mo for a multiple listing service. Uh, the market's really strange right now in that uh, we saw a run up in values uh, the first uh, couple quarters of 2022. Then we saw the interest rates uh, increase from roughly two and a half, three percent uh, to right around seven percent right now. It's right floating right around six, seven percent. Sometimes it goes over seven percent, but it's right around there. Uh, the market really just stopped before I've seen the residential side. Uh, that homes are still selling, uh, but uh, the Price drops are, I've seen continuous price drops as far as from uh, homes that are on the market. But it's, it's a point right now where inventory is still at a very low point. Inventory is at roughly uh, two months. And that was in November for the multiple listing market action. And I have the December one, I just saw it off the press from yesterday. And it's at 1.9 per uh, months. And typically a six month indicator is a balanced market. But with, so right now, normally would be a strong seller's market, but with interest rates jumping up significantly so quickly, uh, I think a lot of homeowners might be in a, a denial of what the properties are worth. Uh, and it's going to be interesting in the next couple of years as far as for this, on the assessment side, as when we start analyzing uh, this year's data, what happens with the values this upcoming year. Um, Excuse I, me, Mike. Yes. On, on the previous slide where you showed the actual uh, selling price of homes, it was pushing half a million dollars, um, and it's still pushing half a million dollars for the average price of a home. That's not driven by mansions. That's driven by houses selling in Bethel, for, it, for instance. It's correctly. It, it, it's driven by, uh, quote, entry-level homes, mm -hmm. uh, which used to be, uh, boy, when I first started, there were $40,000. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Uh, so uh, right now, you're looking at three to $400,000 if you could find something in that price range. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. And that's not just inside urban growth boundaries. I mean, that is throughout that's the county. That's throughout the county. Higher in Florence. If you have cash, that's a great place to be right now because uh, you don't have to worry about the higher interest rates. Uh, we're still seeing homes sell over a million dollars, uh, but a lot of those are uh, people coming from other areas and people with cash as far as buying those properties. And we're not asking for a seeking solutions at this table right now, just elevating the the, it, the importance of uh, the difficulty it is to buy it, uh, to buy a home right now, but which uh, is translated to the difficulty to, to find a place to rent uh, and rental. The, the rental costs uh, it used to be people have always denied, well, that has nothing to do with housing costs. Well, it does. You, you look at the rates, they just go up at the same time. So. Exactly. And property taxes have to do with the rent, too, because that is passed on to the, uh, the tenant um, in, I'd say, in probably all cases, in, in, indirectly or directly. Um, let's see here. Um, new listings have increased significantly. Uh, we are down 21% comparing November of 2021. Uh, and we're down 28% from October of 22. Uh, pending sales have decreased almost 50%. That's huge. That's a, that's a big decrease in pending sales. And from uh, that's from November of 21 and from October of 22, it's down 28%. Um, let's see here. 
the it, here's where you see the average sales price start to flatten out. Uh, <coughs> last month it was at uh, an average of four hundred seventy-six thousand dollars, roughly. Uh, this month it is at four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. So it decreased slightly this past uh, month, according to multiple listing service. Uh, so we're seeing that flattening in the market, and we're also seeing uh, that uh, decline potentially in certain market segments. Uh, let's see here. Other considerations. Uh, there's so many considerations out there. Interest rates, as I already indicated, right around 7%. Inflation was, was huge uh, for particularly our industrial accounts. Our industrial accounts we value uh, with a trend and depreciation method uh, primarily. And we saw some very large increases in our industrial account values because of the inflation and the cost to rebuild these facilities and uh, the values we were getting on the larger uh, facilities from the Oregon Department of Revenue. And that's probably a one-time piece because uh, we, we, we won't probably see that next year as far as that inflation component. And that was a positive piece on taxes collected by having that inflation in some aspects, but a negative piece that can't afford it uh, in some cases. Uh, inventory, again, very low. Uh, uh, it's staying right around that two months component, and I don't see that change anytime really soon. Hopefully, it'll bump up to three or four months inventory, which would be more of a balanced market, but it's anyone's guess right now. Uh, national, global, of course, have impacts as far as on the local market. Uh, measure 50. Um, we're about due for another tax measure. Uh, with the legislative session coming in, uh, we had Measure 5 passed back in 1990, uh, 91, and Measure 50 passed, uh, measure, actually Measure 47 and then 50 passed in 1996. Um, we're, it's about time for another tax measure to pass, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Uh, appeals, appeals. We have about 230 appeals this year, which is about typical as far as for uh, our BOPTA season. We are seeing more and more appeals to the uh, magistrate division of tax court. Um, so that is a, a resource strain on our department. But it's, appeals are a very important aspect in that it helps uh, have a, a, a kind of steam valve effect for taxpayers to be able to dispute their property tax values and make sure we have correct values in the tax roll. Um, let's see, legislative changes, as we talked about, potential legislative funding for our office and other, many other factors. And so that said, that was pretty quick, but I'll go ahead and any questions that you may have. Thank you, Assessor Coles, uh, Deputy Assessor Coles. <laughs> uh, looking around the uh, room for cues. Uh, I see no one in the queue right now. Just a quick, uh, you talk about, kind of offhandedly talk about Measure 5 and Measure 4750. I happened to be on the school board when Measure 5 hit, and I happened to be on the Eugene City Council during Measure 47 and 50. Uh, and if you weren't around then, you don't know how impactful those were on local governments, uh, all the way down to the school, <coughs> school district level. If we do have another tax measure, measure hit that's somewhat similar to either 4750 or Measure 5 in particular, uh, it'll be pretty impactful. You know, we think we have uh, budget issues right now. Uh, it'll really, um, if it's of, of that same magnitude, then it really will have a, a strangle grip on uh, on local governments. But measure, uh, you mentioned measure five when that passed. Uh, the first year that passed, we had, I believe, 4,000 appeals come through because we had the uh, measure five, which was a slow reduction in the tax rates uh, from the uh, existing rates down to $5 for education, $10 for government, and that was phased in for a handful of years. But that just came in the exact same time we saw a huge increase in values. And so people expected to see large tax uh, decreases, and they actually saw increases in many cases uh, when Measure 5 passed. Mm -hmm. uh, measure 47 and 50, uh, of course, rolled the property tax values back to the 95 level, minus 10 percent. And so that uh, has kept the uh, revenue coming into the tax districts fairly stable, which is a, a good aspect, and fairly stable for taxpayers uh, each year. Um, but again, uh, we're at a point where it's just, I think it's just time for another, not a 
advocating for one, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just uh, it's been a long time since we've had a major reform. And that stability is what makes it attractive to the voters, and and that is what's usually talked about during the uh, during the uh, process of you know getting on the ballot. But the uh, you know Measure Five, for instance, changed the way we fund schools um, completely. I mean, a complete. If something like that happens again, you know, the impact of Measure Five was so broad spread, and so deeply, um, f f so deeply affected uh, public schools, uh, in particular. If something like that happens, um, you know, business as usual has gone out the window. Uh, personally, I'd take away a lot of local control too, because it would actually the funds go to the state. The fund redistribute the state redistributes those funds, mm -hmm. and so uh, it, the monies that we do collect uh, for school districts do go to the state and are reimbursed back according to their formulas. So we have donor districts, and we have uh, districts yes. who live off the donors. And here locally, we have donor districts. Correct. <laughs> Mr. Rickoff. Yes, just a quick point of logistics. If you believe you have uh, the deputy assessor's phone numbers, do check it against that list because his numbers have changed. Right on. Uh, Commissioner. Yes, Mr. Collins, just a curiosity point. I've always, you know, real estate obviously fascinates me, but just how many of the appeals would you say on a percentage are, say, won by the customer versus um, retained by the taxation department? I, I like to think of it less of winning, more the winning for both of us if right. we get the right value. But to answer your question specifically, I'd say probably 60%, somewhere in that range. It really depends as far as the type of property. And uh, uh, it depends also on the evidence that's provided, obviously. Uh, we try to stipulate two values beforehand, uh, before the end of the year, to make sure if we have any uh, outrageous uh, property uh, discrepancies. But I'd say probably 50, 60 percent, but it depends each year on the board. And uh, it's a matter of just trying to find the proper value for those properties. And also knowing that we have a lot of properties we haven't looked at for 30 years. And so it's either recalculated or trended. And so it helps us get the correct value on the tax roll and also information for the, the properties. Well, it's a great testament to your office, too, that you work with people really well. So that's always obviously the point. Thank you very much. That was a compliment. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, the small set-aside that's going through the legislature this session. I'll, you know that uh, Associated of Oregon Counties is backing that, and, and that is moving forward. And Mr. Kyler has his, uh, his eye and thumb on that exact thing. It's uh, small in terms of the overall government, but it's pretty huge in what is how it's going to affect local ass assessors. It would be a, a big boost. Right now, we receive a predominant of our funds through the CAFA grant, which Alex mentioned, that's right around 15 to 17% of our uh, general or our operating budget. Uh, it used to be 35 to 40% years ago. And uh, so I'm hoping that uh, the tax districts will be able to uh, 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 contribute to the uh, work that we do to. That's, uh, it should be easy to accept. Ms. Mokarajski, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. You can't see it. We know it is exactly accurate, and you are spot on as far as the, uh, your um, agenda is concerned. Our presenters are doing a great job so far, uh, and we thank them for that. So thank you, Mike, and look forward to Mike's uh, continued uh, work over the next few weeks and months here in helping that transition. We're going to turn it over to um, Sheriff Harold, uh, DA Perlo, uh, Eve Gray, our Health and Human Services Director, and Greg Rickoff, our Community uh, Justice and Rehabilitation Director, to walk through a presentation on public safety. So here's this section. We're going to talk about, a little bit about public safety. We're going to talk about public health. We'll get into the, the uh, details around the budget, and then we'll wrap with some questions. So we're about halfway through our discussion. All right. And since we're on time, uh, we get to go over, right? Um, I get to lead off the public safety discussion. It's intended to be, a, uh, you know, a high altitude flyover. Uh, looking forward to detailed conversations uh, downstream as we get into the budget. Um, but I need to start the conversation just as a reminder with uh, what what we operate with here in Lane County. Um, I was looking at the 2018 statistics the FBI keeps on officers per thousand. That was the most recent I could find, um, where they indicate uh, about a two and a half officers per thousand uh, average across our nation. It's really heavily weighted to the East Coast. The East Coast has cities with in the area of four officers per thousand, uh, which um, skews the average. The western uh, western side of the country and mountain region is much more likely to be in the 1.5 officers per thousand range, even in our larger cities. Um, we know sheriff's offices staff differently than police departments. Uh, there's no sheriff's office, I don't think, in the nation that has 
even probably one uh, deputy per thousand. Um, you have up there an Oregon Sheriff's Office's average, but that's not accurate. Somehow when the fl slides were reformatted, that number changed. The so accurate number for 2021 based on a sheriff's survey is 0.71 uh, for Oregon Sheriff's Office average. And um, our average disappeared off the slide when they were reformatted, it's 0.19. And that's with the addition of the um, SRS ad package from last year of uh, eight FTE. And just uh, sort of a reminder as we talk about this level of coverage, of course the sheriff serves all of the county with respect to a lot of our functions. Corrections is the biggest one, but um, when we think about court service, uh, that's a sheriff's office function. And so if there's a protective order to be served because of a domestic violence incident and it's in downtown Eugene, that's a sheriff's deputy that serves that, not a police officer. Um, so there's a number of the sheriff's functions that really are countywide, uh, but then our patrol function is really focused on the unincorporated area. And uh, I was uh, reflecting on a comment um, Commissioner Buck made uh, when she was re-sworn in on Monday about remembering that we have a significant portion of our um, impoverished population which lives in unincorporated Lane County. And you really notice that when you go out to one of our, uh, seems like annual um, major disaster events where we're recognizing the population that is living in those unincorporated areas and the needs that they have. I'm already spending too much time talking. Um, this is just a different way to show that. Uh, I used our five comparator counties. Commissioner, or uh, Administrator Mokorajski talked about those. Again, we've got a data um, error. Clackamas does not have 789 deputies. They have 189 uh, enforcement deputies. But an average of our comparators for deputies per thousand is about 0.4 um, if you average the other five counties. And just for context, we would need to hire uh, 41 additional sworn patrol staff in Lane County to reach Jackson County's 0.3. One of the things that uh, as a team we wanted to discuss with you today is uh, the mental health, uh, behavioral health issues in our county and how that impacts the public safety system. So each of the speakers will be talking about that. These are our calls for service, unincorporated Lane County calls for service where a deputy is requested. And what I have circled are two categories, mental health and suicidal subject. These are not calls that necessarily related in a case number. So this is when the dispatcher answers the phone, they make a determination how to categorize the call. And they, it might be categorized as a mental health call for service. It might be a suicidal subject. But mental health lives in so many more of these. If you look to the far right, suspicious conditions, a call that comes in as suspicious conditions that could be an individual in the middle of the street screaming, yelling, something along those lines. Same could be said of disorderly subject, which is about in the middle. Same could be said of a check welfare call, uh, which could be check on my neighbor because I don't think they're doing very well mentally. And so it's really hard for us to wrap our hands around what the true impact is for calls for service but uh, we definitely know that it's a significant portion of the calls for service. Super pleased to get to talk about mobile crisis response. It's a nationwide conversation, of course. It's a conversation here in Oregon. Everybody's familiar with the CAHOOTS model that the city of Eugene has had for some time. I grew up as a patrol deputy uh, wishing that we had availability of a CAHOOTS service. We'd be a couple doors outside the city and in Santa Clara and ask, you know, city, could we pretty please use cahoots? And usually the answer was no, because it was being paid for by city residents, not, not the unincorporated residents. We have this uh, mobile crisis response um, experiment that's been going on in Western Lane County. It's housed with the fire department in Florence. It started with a citywide effort and then expanded into unincorporated Lane County. Similar to cahoots in Eugene, when it was initially a city of Florence uh, resource, um, mobile crisis response workers could go out and interact with somebody at the McDonald's in Florence, knowing that if that situation became dangerous, uh, the city police could be there in a short period of time. Um, and so there wasn't a huge impact and it was of huge benefit uh, to the city, of course, and to the police department. As they expanded in, into unincorporated Lane County, we've had a, just a ton of conversations with them, monthly meetings with them, by the way. It's a great group of people in Florence, including Peace Health, um, uh, uh, Sayusla Outreach Services, anyway, it's a great group. And um, a lot of conversation about how do we take this service into unincorporated Lane County and also make sure that the crisis response workers are safe. Do you send them 20 miles up Highway 36 um, not knowing what level of crisis might be encountered? What we have been successful at doing because, again, the board 
dipped into reserves and provided us funding for two deputies to be assigned to uh, West Lane County. We've built a really great cooperative working relationship with those folks. And so once MCR leaves the city, it's much more like a, a co-deployment model, which other counties have, where there's a, a law enforcement officer and a mental health licensed uh, individual who are riding around. So for example, Marion County has a system. It's uh, two Salem officers, one Woodburn officer, and one Marion County Sheriff's deputy. Their schedules work so that they have coverage. Anytime one of them is on duty, they've got a mental health worker with them, and they'll go countywide. So if it's the Salem officer's day to work, that Salem officer goes anywhere in the county. Same for the Woodburn officer, the Marion County deputy's day to work, he, could, he or she goes anywhere in the county. That's what it looks like for West Lane MCR right now. South Lane is uh, working on developing a, a mobile crisis response. I've had just a couple of phone conversations as they're looking. It doesn't sound like... You know, in, in uh, West Lane, the fire department was interested in housing and, and sort of being operationally uh, plugged into it. Doesn't sound like that's the case in South Lane. And so they're um, contemplating other um, potential organizations who might take that on. Um, I do want to share a really quick success story because I love success stories. Got an individual that is about 20 miles up 36. His neighbor called in in early August worried about him. He'd lost his wife and he was making suicidal statements. We happened to, happen to, uh, happen to have one of our West Lane deputies on duty at the time. Uh, before responding out there, he contacted Mobile Crisis Response. They um, went to the call together. Uh, the mental health worker was able to do some assessments. Mobile Crisis Response, after that call in August, made 24 follow-up calls to this individual, keeping uh, him engaged and working to try to get him some resources. The sheriff's office only received one additional call after that first call in August, and it was in January, and uh, it was a different neighbor that didn't know what all was going on. And so we'll never know how many calls didn't come into the sheriff's office for this um, person who got connected with mobile crisis response, um, but we know it's a great thing. Um, transitioning over into our jail, and we got to talk a bunch about this yesterday, which I'm thankful for, recognizing the... Um, Audience is slightly different today. I'll try not to replow a bunch of ground, and I have a couple of different pieces of information. Um, but we certainly know the mental health crisis is impacting our jails. We talked about um, <clears throat> this slide really is just showing you, uh, you know, the number of bookings we had fiscal year 21 to 22, and then to compare to our um, medication costs. So we got this from our partner, WellPath, the same fiscal year. Um, spending $163,500 on psychotropic medications for our in-custody um, population during that same fiscal year. And then if you look down uh, towards the bottom of the slide, we had uh, 1,258 individuals who are in our custody that were prescribed psychotropic medication, comparing that against our 8,000 bookings. Now, when we say 8,000 bookings, those aren't individual people, those are individual bookings. And so it would not at all be unusual, uh, particularly for a person who is on psychotropic medications, to have multiple bookings into our jail in a year. And so um, I don't have the information right in front of me, but we could easily compile sort of a top 20 list, um, which Health and Human Services led the charge on a number of years ago as far as that frequent users. Sheriff Harold, uh, uh, Vice Chair Trigger has a question. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question. The, on the bottom there, the medication numbers, I assume those are not necessarily unduplicated. In other words, there might be an AIC who's both on a non-psychotropic and a psychotropic medication, but really it's the psychotropic medication that's a significant number, right? Yes. To look at. And then uh, what was my other question? Oh, um, there must be folks who come in and through the care that they get while they're in custody, it's identified that they need those medications. They haven't necessarily been on them before they came into custody. What happens when they leave custody? How do they continue their medication regimen? Yeah, I'm uh, super proud of the service um, in conjunction uh, with WellPath that we, we do have a psychiatrist who's able to prescribe individuals who are in our custody that weren't previously prescribed. And when they depart our custody, they are given a prescription for the medication, uh, which can be filled at a local um, a pharmacy. And I don't remember off the top of my head uh, how many days worth uh, that prescription is um, provided to them. So free of cost, they can go fill it and not pay for the drug at the pharmacy. Um, what we do find is that, uh, unfortunately, not very many of those are filled. Um, wanted to plug this slide in. I know frequent uh, or, or future speakers are going to speak a little bit about 
the levy. And, and initially, I didn't have this slide in because we talked about it so much yesterday. But for consistency's sake, as you look at the way it impacts other uh, departments, we plopped this in. The, uh, the colors got messed up a little, so don't, don't be confused. The blue levy does not correspond with the blue triangle. Um, the orange chunk of that pie graph is the levy funding for jail revenues in 22. <clears throat> Same thing you saw yesterday, but the colors have changed just a little bit. And of course, just recognizing that 52% of our revenues for the jail function coming from the levy. If we didn't have the levy, we just we just wouldn't have a, a functional system. And as we talked about yesterday, the jail being that core piece, that the entire public safety system suffers if you don't have a functional jail to include reentry services and, um, and, and the court and um, the defense bar not being able to connect with their clients. And it uh, ultimately results in not being able to interrupt criminal behavior on a shorter path. It allows people to get much farther down their path of criminality, which is not a good result for the community or for the individual. Um, and then as we talked yesterday, we have really prioritized um, mental health within our facility. And I, I mentioned to you that I got to watch sheriffs before me who uh, initially was, there was just a lot of frustration that we were running what felt like a mental institution. And then that wasn't, um, typically what a sheriff's office did in their jail. And watching um, particularly Sheriff Byron Trapp recognize that it doesn't matter if that was traditionally our job or not, that is who is in our custody. We do have a charge to take good care of the people who are in our custody and we need to think of better ways to do that. And so really put us on this path of um, being more creative about how we do that. And um, I shared with you uh, yesterday the traditional corrections um, thought process is poor behavior means more time locked in your cell and less time um, accessing uh, any sort of what would be considered privilege or even just having interaction um, with others. And so turning that on its head, investing in um, a larger number of mental health trained staff through our contract provider, investing in some special uh, sworn staff to, to really coordinate with those mental health staff looking at our jail population daily to see who's in our custody, who would benefit from a specialized management plan in, and uh, taking them out of a traditional corrections approach and trying something different. Um, and so we're able to offer this now. We have 56 beds available for um, any gender of in custody individual. They're getting trauma-informed care group sessions led by a, a mental health licensed um, individual. Um, they're working on uh, opportunities to learn about the effects of their substance abuse, uh, impact on trauma uh, uh, on the brain and body, how to resolve conflict with fellow adults in custody, how to resolve conflict with staff. Um, and um, obviously we intend and are seeing positive results in how that impacts their behavior while in custody. And then certainly we're hopeful that that's providing them with skills uh, so that they don't return to custody once, once they depart. Talk a little bit about mental health evaluations, and we could go uh, we could go on forever about uh, these. They're called 370 evaluations, which is just the last part of a state statute. 161.370 describes this process of determining whether or not a person is fit to proceed uh, within the American criminal justice system. So we have this base concept that if you are not um, mentally capable really of aiding and assisting in your own defense, then it's not appropriate um, to put you through the justice system. And so these evaluations are a court um, response to determine is it appropriate for this person to go through the typical criminal justice system or not. And uh, these evaluations have been piling up in the state of Oregon. Um, there's endless amounts of uh, articles that you could read about how the state of Oregon has struggled with this. Uh, one of the things um, that we have done with this mental health sergeant that I mentioned is a better coordination of a person who is in our custody. They've had their first court appearance. The judge has determined, you know what, there needs to be a 370 evaluation before we can decide if this case can proceed. And what happens in jails across our state is that individual sits in a jail for weeks and weeks and weeks waiting for this evaluation. Um, Traditionally, it meant a transport to the state hospital for an evaluation. COVID obviously impacted um, our, our society tremendously. And one of the things it did is it um, brought technology more to bear for all of us in our Zoom meetings. It also brought it more to bear within our facilities. And so 
we have technology within our building to do a, uh, an evaluation that is um, through technology, if appropriate, uh, depending on which case. And so our mental health sergeant is able to coordinate uh, evaluations without transport in often in many cases. That opens up the field of evaluators. And so rather than being restricted to an evaluator whose office is in Eugene or a transport to Salem, we might have an evaluator who's qualified to do the evaluation who's in their office in Florida and they're able to do that um, uh, through technology. And so that means we are working as quickly as we can to get the person in our custody that evaluation so the court can decide how it proceeds rather than having someone sit in a jail for, for weeks un, uh, without knowing whether or not the case can proceed. So uh, we coordinated 120 of these within our uh, facility. Over the last year, um, our transport section provided 104 transports to the state hospital. Uh, last year. This doesn't take into any account the evaluations that were ordered by the Eugene Municipal Court. And this was a little over a year ago, I told the city of Eugene that I wouldn't do those for them anymore. And so the city of Eugene Municipal Court through their police department is responsible for facilitating those mental health evaluations that are ordered by a municipal court. Similar to the Springfield Municipal Jail, they have people in their custody for municipal charges. If the judge in Springfield Muni Court orders an evaluation, uh, that person's in their custody and they facilitate that evaluation. So the only difference is I'm renting beds to the city of Eugene within our jail, uh, but their muni court is still responsible for those evaluations. Um, and then just before I turn this over, I, I, I do, this was intended to be a high altitude flyover, but I oftentimes uh, feel like when we have these conversations, they get a little sterile because we're policymakers and that's kind of the world we're in. Um, but I like to try and bring it um, just a little contextual. So today there's going to be a hearing in Lane County Circuit, Circuit Court involving an individual who a couple of years ago um, thought that the utility crew that was working on the road uh, outside of the place he was residing um, were engaged in, in some sort of spy behavior. And uh, this was unincorporated Lane County. He went out and, and menaced these individuals with a firearm because he didn't like them installing spyware in his road. Uh, he then returned to where he lives, which happens to be the basement of a senior um, home where there's, there are th three uh, senior women living who had mobility issues. Uh, so he returned to that location with his firearm. The utility crew was quite alarmed. They left the area. They called the sheriff's office to say, hey, we've got a job we're supposed to be doing out there and, and we can't do it because this individual threatened us with a firearm to stop doing it. Uh, sheriff's deputies responded out there, uh, tried to contact the individual. He started firing his rifle through the door of the residence that he was in and fired over the course of the next several hours, hundreds of rounds um, at the deputies uh, and, and future responding folks. We have a video about this event on our website. I'd love for you to go check it out. Um, it, it will cause your pulse to go up. Um, but if you go to lanesheriff.org on the left side, there's a, a tab for videos. It's the third one down. It's called the Butler Road Incident. I bring all that to your attention. That individual uh, was arrested. Uh, he was um, sent to the state hospital, and um, he's been there for actually a, a longer period of time than usual. Uh, but because of the Mossman order, which some of you have heard about, he was sent back to Lane County, um, not, not fit to proceed, and the state hospital, because of the Mossman order, won't be spending any more time trying to get him fit to proceed. So now our community has to make a decision, uh, you know, how do we address this? So he, he, his mental health is such that he doesn't belong in the criminal justice system, but his behavior is quite dangerous to the public. And that's the, that's the conundrum that we talk about so much is how do we balance this significant public safety need for our friends and neighbors and family and the people who work for me that respond to these calls uh, and the individual's uh, rights and, and need for medical treatment. But you're going to tell us how do we do that? I was waiting right, for that. that. I figured it out. Yeah. And the answer is That's a help. for the deputies. Okay. But very briefly, Sheriff, uh, one thing that you didn't mention is uh, as we fly over the counties, uh, we often compare ourselves to Marion County, and you talked about uh, mobile crisis in Marion County and the coordinated effort there. Lane County is roughly four times larger than Marion County in area. Yeah. So we're at um, 4,700 uh, 4, 4, square miles. Marion County is at about 1,200 square miles. So bear that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, I know you do, but we all should. And the deputies 
uh, were not physically harmed. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, again, very uh, high level uh, discussion here today in terms of budget and uh, behavioral health in our county falls in the public safety group of, um, of budgets. So you will see me come forward with behavioral health when we talk about public safety and the rest of the divisions are on their own in the health and human services uh, portion of a budget presentation. Uh, so just some basic information about our budget in behavioral health. Uh, our current operating budget is just over $39 million. Uh, of this, just under 600,000 or 1.5% came from the general fund last year. Um, the only general fund that is allocated toward behavioral health or behavioral health programs is specifically meant to supplement uh, care of the forensic population is what we call them, um, which uh, the sheriff respond, uh, referred to uh, 370 is a portion of that um, population. But these are individuals who are involved in our criminal justice system and also have a serious and persistent mental illness. Uh, so we have been persistently underfunded in the area of forensics. Uh, the state does provide funding to assist us with this population, but they are growing. And as the sheriff referred to, we have a, a court decision that has led to a situation where we are likely to see individuals who are criminal justice involved who require uh, inpatient level of care being transported back to our community, uh, not, not treated. Uh, so we are needing to identify resources locally within our community in an already resource-starved environment. Uh, and it's, of course, very concerning that a number of these individuals have not received treatment to the point that uh, they are safe around other individuals. Uh, we then are responsible within behavioral health to try and identify placements for these individuals uh, with the limited number of placement opportunities that we have, whether that be um, all the way the highest level of care we have in our uh, county is uh, at Peace Health in an inpatient psychiatric unit. And then we have a continuum of care that moves through secure residential, uh, residential facilities that are not secure. There are foster home opportunities for individuals and permanent supportive housing is really the lowest level of care that we offer within our behavioral health system for individuals who are unable to live independently without additional supports around them. Um, all of our other pro behavioral health programs outside of the forensics program are funded through other sources. So uh, we receive a lot of our funding from the state. Uh, also our CCOs, or Coordinated Care Organizations, Pacific Source and Trillium, we provide a number of billable services in our outpatient therapy programs. Those programs are funded through a process of billing for services. Uh, and we also are always uh, going after grants. Uh, we have a very, very prolific grant writer and, um, and lots of work that happens in the divisions to be looking for additional dollars to bring in so that we can minimize um, the pull of local dollars into these very important programs. So looking forward into the 23 to 24 year, um, we anticipate significant growth in the areas of crisis services and residential services. So I think most everyone here is familiar with the 988 implementation that occurred last summer. Uh, and in order to supplement 988, the idea is to build a system for behavioral health that is similar to our 911 system. You call 911, Someone, no matter where you are, someone is supposed to respond to you in order to provide you with services and if you need to be transported somewhere, there's a location to take you. So the vision is that 
you can call 988 for your behavioral health crisis. A mobile crisis team um, will, no matter where you are in the county, be able to be deployed uh, to respond. And ultimately, a stabilization center will be stood up so that if you require transport for your behavioral health condition, there's a location to take you that is not the emergency room or the jail. Um, so lots and lots of work in terms of standing up the system. We do not have today mobile crisis services across our county uh, in all of the incorporated and unincorporated areas. And of course, we are working very hard on the Stabilization Center project and standing that up. There's a lot of work that uh, we'll be doing and Alex will be doing on a legislative advocacy side as well in the session in those areas. Residential services as well, we have really had a chronically underfunded system. And when, when we deinstitutionalized uh, individuals who experienced severe and persistent mental illness, we never did the other side of that, which is bringing forward um, housing opportunities for folks so that they can live successfully with their chronic disability. <clears throat> and, uh, and so we are now seeing a greater investment from the state in residential services. We anticipate 70 to 80 additional beds coming into our system over the next six months uh, from a recent investment uh, from the state last, uh, or this fiscal year. and. Uh, are certainly hoping to see similar types of investments going forward. Uh, because if, if we don't have anywhere, once we treat folks who are in crisis, for them to recover and stabilize, then they'll go right back into the system again. Uh, we also are focused on revenue generation within our billable areas. Some of you will be familiar that um, rates for many behavioral health providers increased this past year, and that is fantastic. We actually already received some enhanced rates, so we're not seeing as much of a bump in revenue as some of our other safety net providers, though we are very, very thankful that our safety net providers are seeing, the ones who don't receive the enhanced rates are seeing those today. Um, but we are just continuing to make sure that we are capturing all of the revenue that we can possibly bill for. And workforce is a huge deal. You saw this in our uh, economic forecast that uh, health care and, of course, behavior Behavioral health is incorporated into that sector, is anticipated to see significant growth, is already significantly behind in terms of employment, and also is anticipating a significant number of exits uh, over the next five to 10 years. Uh, so we are working on gathering a community collaborative right now. There's at least 25 organizations who are intending to come together in Lane County and talk about how we accelerate growth in our behavioral health workforce, and that's going to include um, safety net providers, it will include universities, and it will include funders all at the table together to be trying to solve this problem in an innovative way uh, that can help us get ahead of this trend. So with that, questions? Thank you. I'll look for a queue for questions. Uh, Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is somewhat tied to what the sheriff had mentioned, but on the mobile crisis and the stabilization center, in some sense, I feel like we're leaving money on the table because we are now able to get federally reimbursed for CAHOOTS or CAHOOTS lights like programs if we're able to stand them up. Um, but we have a workforce problem, and that's really challenging work. Um, and when, but, but if we don't get those people, and we aren't able to land one in South Lane, there's a critical service that has money to be paid for that's not being utilized. And um, so I guess I'm asking, how you feel the timeline is for that, and then how that lines up with the Mental Health Stabilization Center, because that's where these people will most likely be dropped off in the timeline for that. Right. Um, so it, in terms of mobile crisis, uh, we are having productive conversations right now in South Lane uh, with one provider in particular who uh, is interested in standing up services there. It's a little bit, um, difficult in, in Lane County, many of 
the other counties because they don't have their own um, well ingrained systems. We were ahead of the curve. Um, so they are creating really a single system to cover their entire county. And ours is a bit of a patchwork at the moment. So um, Dr. Gisho, he will be focusing very heavily on mobile crisis and that system development over the next year as we're thinking about really bringing together linkages and assuring that folks are um, operating uh, using similar standards and as efficiently as possible, maximizing reimbursement whenever possible. There are some challenges as well that uh, that in many cases our mobile crisis systems and locally in the past have been quite anonymous. And that has been very uh, reassuring to folks who are calling for mobile crisis and yet to receive some of the reimbursement that is coming forward on mobile crisis, we need to be collecting identifying information and insurance information and it has to turn more into a a medicalized type system. And that's a really big shift for us to go through and for our community to go through. So I think that we will be figuring out a lot of those details as we go. And in terms of the link to the Stabilization Center, um, so much of the timeline depends on what happens in this legislative session and whether we can identify a stable funding source. I've said this before and I'll just keep saying it over and over again. We have no way today uh, that we can bill for stabilization center services. So there is either going to need to be a big pot, a, a very large pot of money that's identified from the state that would come in to fund this program fully, or we need to identify codes that we can bill across the board to insurers in order to, um, to even out that burden. It may still need to be supplemented, uh, that may not cover 100%, but would certainly spread the cost. Um, and, and that is a key problem that we have to resolve uh, and really, really need advocacy in this upcoming session to do that. Thank you. And Director Gray, uh, you're a working mother, but you still don't have eyes in the back of your head. If you did, you'd see Alex Kyler sitting behind you nodding and, uh, and, and <laughs> clapping as you're saying the things that he's, uh, he's carrying to Salem. Without belaboring that around this ta table, that is high on the list. Very good. Anyone uh, commercial level? Yes, Ms. Great, thanks. That's great information. That's a lot of it. You talk as fast as I do, so I had to take careful notes, so that's awesome. Um, one, one of the things we experienced with my son when he um, went off to Deschutes County and got involved in their mental health system was you talked about linkages, and their linkages was fairly impressive. I mean, he was uh, intercepted in the middle of Highway 97. The police picked him up. They took him for assessment in the hospital. They took him to a, a center where he was in there for two weeks for an assessment. Then after he got out, there was a homeless place where he could check in. And then he was assigned a counselor where periodically they would um, assess him and have meetings with him and take him to Subway and that sort of thing. And that was a really impressive linkage that I think Lane County is lacking. And I'm wondering just as a freshman question, are we, can we get everybody in the same room and get them on the same page? Yes, and we are engaging in those conversations and, and really focused um, very heavily on linking the components of the system. I think a, a, a big part of our challenge today is the dearth of resources that we have available, uh, that there are not available shelters or available individuals to refer folks to. Waiting lists are unbelievably long. Shelter bed lists are unbelievably long. Uh, even if we can get someone um, ready to move into housing and they're in a shelter, and we even get them a housing voucher, that housing voucher expires in many cases because we cannot find them housing. So, um, so we have so many gaps in the system in terms of just the ability to serve the population uh, that many, many people today are falling through the cracks. So I think part of it is a lack of linkages and part of it is the need for intense investment in all of these parts of the system so that we can um, dig ourselves out of a very, very big hole that we have fallen into. Yeah, no question. The other thing I wanted to bring up too was um, he was also uh, obviously homeless, so he had an OHP card. And OHP, uh, the Bend system took OHP payment as what we said partial payment when we couldn't bill for services. That was their code of which to get those funds from. So I didn't know if that's something that we're doing or involved with now, but I thought it was worth bringing up. In terms of stabilization center? Well, in terms of paying for the services that they're, like you made an example of the yes. uh, the stabilization center services we don't have paid for. So I would say a, a lot, my experience was a large portion of the people that were going through mental health crisis were also homeless, had accessibility or 
cards through OHP. So uh, what's the link with that? Can we help with that? Yes. So um, we have very established mechanisms for billing for residential services, emergency room services, inpatient mental health services um, through Medicaid. Stabilization center is a whole different type of center. And those linkages are not built up yet for if you come in uh, and you're only there for a few hours to be stabilized, for instance, what would be the mechanism to bill for that encounter? Um, and also, what are the requirements? requirements for the various codes in terms of what you're providing within a facility and can you bill the midnight stays that folks are um, billing in inpatient or residential facilities. So just because it's a totally new type of center and no one, uh, no one really has it set up yet within the state of Oregon for how we would bill for all those encounters. Uh, not, to, not to have a snide last comment, but I would hope we would develop a code that would say we're saving people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm on the same page. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Director Gray. Thank um, you. We uh, are pushing the schedule right now, so. Oh. So, uh, Mr. Rickoff is next, and then the Perlo will wrap up this section. And I'm inclined to say, don't rush. I mean, you you make your full presentation. All right, let me uh, march right in. Uh, please know that uh, Community Justice will be in front of you in February to talk more about the, the why and the how of the department. Today I'm gonna focus on the issues at hand. Um, first and foremost, you might have noticed me in the back of the room doing uh, the wave on the inside while the sheriff was giving his presentation. One of the things that come up, um, I wanted to confirm uh, Sheriff Harold's comments yesterday that due to the number of causes, mostly related to underfunding and understaffing um, uh, throughout the system, um, we have an environment that gives criminals the opportunity to practice their criminal behaviors. What we have here in uh, the second bullet, the current clients, you will notice that we have an inverted triangle. Um, statewide, there is a, a risk assessment tool, the LSCMI. Uh, we have a chance to compare ourselves to the other counties, um, and we're inverted from those counties. We have more people at high risk of reoffending um, than we do who, you know, low and medium. And, um, that is relatively unusual. We are not alone, but we are very lonely in that data. Um, clients served, you're gonna notice uh, a decrease. We're losing uh, about uh, four clients uh, a month as this goes down. Um, why that's important is that really ties into the funding structure, the, the state formula. There are winners and losers in that state formula system, and, and we unfortunately are losing. With 10% of the population, we're down to under 9% of uh, the client funding in that system. Another problem with the funding system is it assumes everybody is roughly at um, the, a medium risk, so we're not being compensated for the fact that we have a, a remarkable number of folks at high and very high risk. I do want to flag, uh, uh, Mr. Mokrajski talked a little bit about um, innovation here at the county. One of the things that we're doing is we have developed a, a mental health unit that involves three sworn officers right now. We expect that to grow to four sworn officers and a, a sergeant here in the next future. Uh, in the near future, we've got 170 clients. This is a mobile street outreach team. This is led by a qualified mental health professional. Um, several of the officers are uh, pursuing um, uh, their ability to have uh, the QH, QMHP designation as well. Um, it's a place where we can grow our own. Um, they have an interest, they, they're committed to their field of public safety, and they know they need these skills to be able to work with the individuals that uh, are on their caseload. A lot of our um, folks with psychiatric disabilities are unhoused. They live on um, the streets uh, of all of our communities. Um, and they are most likely to abscond. They're most likely not to show up to appointments with their social services. So we need to become mobile and we need to get out and, and visit them where they are and connect them to services. Where it differs from the CAHOOTS model is um, these individuals have cases to be managed. So it's not a one-off um, trans transactional contact. It's really working with these individuals as humans that 
deserve to have um, all of the support services. Um, so we, we really look forward to that. Please note that in the parole and probation side, uh, there's no general fund revenue. It is all those special funds coming in from CCA and JRI. Uh, we look forward to um, working with you all as uh, we explain the funding mechanism and why we can, would contend that the state model for funding these programs are, is, is no longer effective. Uh, real quickly, in uh, youth services, there's nobody that runs the, the gambit of services that Lane County provides for youth services. Uh, there's simply no other uh, county in the, the state that, that has this full range of services. This only starts to, uh, to scratch the surface uh, surface again when we're with you in February. We'll talk more about this. Uh, please note all of our youth are justice involved youth and if we are not effective in our interventions they will become involved in the, the justice system uh, throughout their lives they're much more likely to be unhoused um, uh, if we fail them at this level there are uh, really significant uh, consequences to that um, we're really proud of the services we offer whether it's the um, the Phoenix treatment residential program, our detention services, you know, really are um, top notch. We, we also run three separate school systems. And not only is, do, you know, do we have the um, uh, education and vocation program with culinary and horticultural arts and sciences, uh, we run the education program within the juvenile detention and the um, education program with, within the long-term uh, care and treatment uh, program. So really quickly, uh, we do draw significantly on the general fund for youth services. The levy represents about 17% of our overall funding. Um, that it doubles our beds for the residential treatment and the detention programs. It represents 14 and a half uh, full-time employees, half a million dollars in materials and services. It is essential funding. We couldn't be doing what we're doing without the levy fund. Um, the special revenue fund is really coming in um, largely from the school dis districts, uh, but not exclusively. It, uh, it certainly helps uh, supplement what we're doing, um, but we need all three legs of this stool uh, to keep doing what we're doing. Um, I will leave it there. Can I just bring this to you? Um, I was asked to talk to you about the intersection of uh, the mental health crisis and my office and from my communication with you yesterday you can probably assume that that's not my highest budgetary priority but it is definitely uh, there is a cross-section and generally it means that our other systems have failed if somebody's getting charged with committing crimes uh, while in a, in a mental health mental health crisis uh, really quick, I want to talk a little bit about the legislative session. Uh, my office used to be funded pretty significantly by the state, and over the years they have disinvested. Uh, the last budget, the only items that were funded by the state were part of my salary and the transcripts from grand jury recordation. The Oregon District Attorneys Association has some policy option packages going to the legislature to increase the funding uh, from the legislature related to the increase in workload that they have given my office over the years. Um, and I would ask, I know AOC is supporting all but one of those and may support uh, bringing the deputy DAs into uh, PERS, police and fire going forward, but uh, it would fund some of the other things like the body-worn camera, the, the digital evidence that we just can't manage and there's no funding. I mean, it's just, uh, Every case from Eugene police, you know, if 12 officers show up, every one of them is wearing a body-worn camera. Their cars all have video. We are trying to manage this, not just uh, providing it to the defense, but also reviewing it as we decide whether to charge cases. So I would ask you to, to follow the, the legislature uh, on those issues, and I know Alex is cued in on that as well. Uh, also coming from the legislature on the issue of the intersection of uh, 
mental health crisis and my office. Senator Manning has proposed a bill. Uh, there has been an expansion in what's called set aside or expungement, erasing or sealing people's criminal convictions and the police records. We had 1,400 of those last year from 400 the year before. It is now, uh, and there was no funding. It was passed with a uh, zero fiscal attached to it. The court has had to deal with it. I've had to deal with it. But where this relates to mental health is the new bill proposes uh, sealing the records of people who have been found guilty except for insanity. So people who uh, were restored and able to go through the criminal justice system and then um, found guilty except for insanity. All of those set-asides on felony cases give people access to purchase and possess firearms. And so of those 1,400 cases that we processed last year, all of the felony convictions mean that those people can possess firearms. And now we're being asked, or the legislature is going to consider letting people who have mental illness issues and no idea whether they are fully treated, untreated, but they are timed out of the system to possess firearms. So I'm hoping that that one doesn't proceed any further. Um, how else does this affect, the intersection affect our community? Since 2019, five Lane County residents have been killed, murder charges, uh, by people who had a crossover with our behavioral health system. Two of them had prior civil commits, two of them had prior criminal charges but were found unable to aid and assist, and one of them was uh, receiving uh, services here. Uh, and so we have a, a true crossover. Um, I didn't push the buttons. I, didn't, I don't really like um, PowerPoint. <laughs> I don't know where we, did we are. For you, Patty. Yeah, there okay. you go. Yep. All right. So I don't really like dealing with all of this PowerPoint stuff. I just want to talk to you. Um, so where does the crossover happen in our office? Well, of the 2,800 projected cases filed in 2022, I didn't actually pull that number. Sorry for the final number. 113 people were found unfit to proceed meaning that they could not aid and assist and were referred either to the state hospital or to local community restoration. I don't know how many people from Lane County this fall went up to the state hospital or were uh, or, or prior to the Mossman order, but statewide 354 people since the Mossman order were released back to communities without having received restoration. And so, you know, we were, the sheriff was talking about the gentleman who was firing at deputies. We had an assault case. And then people are criticizing, why are you sending misdemeanants up to the state hospital? That's really expensive. Well, this person was an adult living with his parents and assaulted one of his parents, was sent to the state hospital, was unable to aid and assist, was returned after 90 days, not restored, not treated, Parents are calling my office saying, what's going to happen now? He's going to kill us. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. These people are returning back to our community without, if the charges are dismissed, nothing. And that's what's happening in a lot of these cases is the person is not going to be able to be restored in the amount of time the Mossman order provides. 90 days on a misdemeanor, six months on a felony, and a year on a violent felony, you know, Measure 11 case or a homicide. The, the opportunities to uh, carry these face, cases forward or to insist that someone receive medication are limited to uh, a homicide where the circumstances allow for a court to civilly commit under an extremely dangerous, mentally ill person uh, statute. Um, the only time medication can be forced is on one of these Measure 11 type cases where a court can make specific findings only on that kind of case that medication is necessary to, to uh, restore that person to be able to aid and assist. So we are at a complete crossroads and a complete failure in serving the people who have mental illness. They're being released to the streets if the, if the charges are dismissed and they don't agree to receive services. And 
the jail isn't an appropriate place to house people. We can't restore people uh, to uh, be able to aid and assist in our jails. They've already been determined to not be appropriate for community restoration when they were sent to the state hospital. And so the, the system is really broken. And what we I would like to see is the legislature make it uh, possible for people to be civilly committed. Uh, at, at this juncture, the bar is so high that we can rarely achieve that. Uh, I would like to see opportunities for medication when somebody has committed crimes. Uh, and again, this would require a legislative fix because our appellate courts have said a person has a right to be mentally ill and has a right not to be medicated. And yet this person isn't in a, in a position to be making those rational choices. So there are a lot of things that need to happen at the legislative level that can overcome the constitutional barriers that our appellate courts have created. So what do we have? We have uh, three robust treatment courts. And one of them is our mental health court. In order for a person to be able to participate in mental health court, they have to be able to aid and assist. So we have to get them to that restored level before they can actually enter and receive uh, the <clears throat> benefits of the program. In November, we had 20 active participants, four people in the evaluation phase, 11 graduates, which if you have uh, attended a graduation for any of the treatment courts, they're fabulous. Mental health court, getting somebody to graduation is particularly difficult. Uh, the first two years of the program, we didn't have any graduates because we didn't have housing for people who were engaged in the program. And you can't get somebody to uh, be able to show up to appointments and, and uh, engage in treatment and show up to court. So uh, four of the graduates were downward departures, meaning they would have gone to prison based on their charges. I mean, these were prison eligible charges, but they engaged in this program, made it to graduation, and did not uh, take up four prison beds. And I have one prosecutor for all three of our treatment courts in Lane County. Uh, I would say that the state legislature back in 2015 gave us some grants for, uh, for prosecutors to not send people to prison. And three lawyers were funded for that. And those grants, of course, went away as the state's commitment to funding the Justice Reinvestment Initiative went away, and, and so uh, the money's lessened every year, and they've decided not to fund prosecutors. The same thing is happening for our treatment court prosecutor, who is funded out of uh, state money through the Criminal Justice and Commission, and our application was denied the last time around to fund the prosecutor. Uh, Lane County appealed, and they just have continued to kick that down the road, but it is likely that the legislature will not fund that position because they don't see the value in state money going to uh, fund a necessary element of these treatment courts. You can't. Yeah, Pearl, uh, yeah. Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Trigger has a question. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Just quickly, the civil commitment. That's a whole. That's a whole topic and and very complex and um, sort of a loaded conversation. But even if the legislature were to pass something and and um, and you could hold. We could civilly commit folks. What are the resources that ex where would we where would they be held? Uh, well, <laughs> that's funny you say that because the state hospital was purposely built too small for the population when it was actually built. But a number of the people who are being held on three seven O's would not be three seven O's. They would be civil commits uh, because it's the same population. It's redefining people. some of the same folks. So we would just okay. be thank you redefining the same people, but obviously. I mean, I don't want to say obviously, but a greater investment needs to be made to expand the, the beds at the state hospital and the services available to the counties. Thank you, DA Perlow. Looking to a queue for any further questions for District Attorney Perlow? I have thousands of them. But, I know. That, um, this is such a huge topic, and um, I'm happy to talk to anybody further about any of it. It is, um, anyway. 
Thank you, Dave Perlow. And uh, you, you've really done nothing more than excite our questions. And uh, I, I don't think we have the time around this table right now to really dig deeply into uh, into community restoration alone, for instance. And what does that mean to our our uh, capacity in our mental health system and our residential capacity in our in our housing local housing um, system? So it's uh, it is what you've underlined is a system wide issue that isn't. That it comes to a head of the DA's office, but it exists throughout all of the other departments that we're hearing from. Well, when it gets to our office, it means somewhere else it's failed. And it means that us, with our sending our kids to school each day, worry about can they go to school safely each day. Thanks. Thank you, Chair uh, and Commissioners. And we recognize we only carved out 45 minutes for what is it? Just, that, that doesn't do justice to um, the complexity and the need of that issue, but. We did want to have a little bit of time today while we're talking broadly about our budget, some of these really critical services and also how, how it articulates how interwoven so many of our different systems and services are. So we'll take a few minutes. Uh, Eve Gray is back here to walk through um, a Health and Human Services update and then we'll get into general fund and budget calendar and wrap up. Okay, and I know that we're running behind. So this, uh, this may just be an opportunity for me to remind everyone that health and human services is more than behavioral health. <laughs> um, and I, I won't go into a lot of detail on uh, any of the other divisions or their budgets here. We will have plenty of opportunity to do that when we get to the department level budget work. Uh, but we, our current operating budget is almost $200 million uh, and of that, just shy of 8 million or 4.1% is general fund, which goes toward supporting some of the work in three divisions. Uh, we've already talked about the, the amount that goes to behavioral health, but also human services, particularly uh, certain programs related to support of uh, homeless relief, and uh, also public health, including communicable diseases, women, infants, and children, and some of our family child health program receive general fund support. All other divisions are self-sustaining. And just so that you can see our focus areas for the, the coming year, we, um, we recognize that no one receives the kind of local investment that, that we need in order to do this, to provide the full level of services we would like to provide. Uh, we also recognize that, that we have some opportunities uh, in our area in terms of identifying additional ways to capture revenue, particularly within our federally qualified health center and some areas where we capture fees to try and generate some additional revenue that may have some level of flexibility to be able to offset some of the asks from the general fund. So we're working very hard on the revenue side of the picture. We're also, we know that we expanded very, very rapidly during the pandemic. And when you expand really rapidly, uh, often you don't have time to structure exactly what you, um, what you would have wanted had you had the time to do that. So as we have vacancies, we will be looking very carefully at those vacancies? Do we have, uh, do we need every single position in every single place? Is there a better way to partner across divisions that do similar work so that we can become as efficient as possible? Uh, and also looking at materials and services, uh, particularly our procurement. Uh, we do spend a fair amount of dollars on things like medical supplies every year, and, uh, and we need to make sure that our procurement procedures and our inventory management procedures are really where they need to be so that we have absolutely minimal waste and we are forcing vendors to compete on a regular basis to assure that we are receiving uh, the, lowest, uh, the lowest prices possible, also assuring that we're getting the maximum amount in terms of group purchasing power. So all of those are just the kind of the basics of financial management, going back to the basics uh, after a massive expansion during the pandemic to really try to assist uh, with the, the bigger picture related to our budget challenges as a county. So questions? Looking around the room for cues for questions on a $200 million budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, we spend a lot of time with Health and Human Services and understanding the, uh, the breadth of the services that are provided. I think uh, the questions come as we go, typically with, uh, with Health and Human Services, and, and you and your team are very adept at answering the questions and uh, spending time individually with commissioners in particular uh, to answer questions, so. 
Ms. Borkarski, I think uh, I think that was uh, you caught up a little bit on your schedule due to that uh, excellent performance. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Eve. Okay, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, so we'll get a little more into uh, the general fund here and talking about the budget calendar. Uh, and some of this has been stated, so I'll try and go over the things so we're not repeating too much because you will hear from me again a lot through the budget process as well. Um, so uh, just kind of defining the general fund here, it is the primary operating fund of the county. Every local government will have a general fund and then they add other funds as are needed. Um, our fund consists of discretionary revenues from property and car rental tax collections. Our federal timber receipts go into it. It has some state shared revenues, uh, cigarette, liquor, marijuana taxes, as well as some cable franchise fees and other local revenue sources. Uh, remaining revenues, that, and there's a lot of individual ones um, in the general fund, occur out in departments. Um, so they are receiving some grants into the general fund, um, uh, contracts where they're contracting for work, recording and election fees, um, and then uh, additional, like I said, many different pieces out there. Um, so the fund as a whole, uh, I did want to show you just the resources uh, here by type. Um, so property taxes being our predominant source of uh, revenue in the general fund at 35%. Those other taxes that I mentioned, uh, the state and federal, um, you see state revenue uh, is fairly high at the 13.1%. Uh, once you drop down a bit on the things like administrative charges, those are internal charges uh, many times. So uh, central services lives within the general fund and bills are other county funds. Um, so you'll see that revenue come into the general fund, but the expense living out in other uh, funds. And then our beginning fund balance, uh, which is a large uh, piece of our reserve, uh, being that $34 million. The pie chart on the right is uh, meant to show you the split between what you will hear us refer to as discretionary general fund, uh, that being the uh, revenue including property taxes, and then those things like the timber revenue and state shared revenue uh, that comes into a non-departmental portion of our, depart uh, if, of our budget, and then it is spent out in the areas that you've heard today, uh, public safety and uh, public health and other pieces. Uh, so that discretionary uh, makes up right about, I can't even see my percent. Six, thank you. <laughs> other people are closer. Uh, I can see the department one is about 31. So. Here is where that discretionary pie slice is allocated. Um, so not all of this is being spent because you will notice that contingency and reserves are a big piece of this at the 25.5. Um, but the discretionary revenue, uh, about 50% of it is spent in the public safety areas that you've heard, 10% uh, public health, general government is going to include areas like assessment, taxation, elections. Um, we do have a capital planning reserve that is separate from our contingency and reserve. And then that non-departmental, uh, there's a few county expenses uh, that don't belong in one department but might be charged out later are about 1%. So the history of the general fund, um, and I think we've touched on some of this today, um, but this is just a map here for you of the ONC Timberlands, uh, 2.6 acres shows you down, uh, you know, Pat, even over to the coast. So much more than Lane County, of course, is shown on this map. Um, but Lane County citizens have relied on timber harvest revenue from the federal ONC lands uh, for well over 100 years. Um, so it has funded those areas like sheriff patrol, corrections, criminal prosecution, youth, public health and elections, and many other things that support those. Uh, revenues began a significant decline uh, in when federal forest policies changed in the early 1990s. I would say that decline even started in the 80s for those of us who lived here. Um, from 1992 through 2000, the county uh, made numerous um, budget cuts to respond to just that uh, one revenue problem with the timber revenue. In 2000, Secure Rural Schools legislation was passed for the first time by the federal government. Um, and so that was meant, as has been mentioned, to come in and provide some relief. Um, it wasn't the first federal legislation that was passed, but it was the largest and in the beginning was meant to last for a, a number of years and has continued to be renewed. So initially it was supposed to be only about a five or six year um, wean the counties off of the federal money was the um, language that was used at the time. Uh, that didn't work. Um, and so uh, it has been renewed with the most recent renewal being a three year renewal 
uh, the most recent renewal is also the first time that they didn't continue to step it down. You saw that graph declining over time. They actually said, we will give you the 1718 levels for the next three years. Uh, so that's what you saw on that chart earlier. The use of the secure rural schools and timber funds prior to uh, fiscal year 16, 17, we spent it as we received it. Um, we really did have, as you've heard, some of the financial management changes that have been made a different um, way of looking at the budget back then. Uh, just receiving and spending as we had it, um, which yes, you're keeping services as high as you can, but you're also creating pretty unstable environment that goes up and down, up and down. Um, so that created a lot of reductions um, as soon as we would spend those one-time monies um, on things that were ongoing, we would have to make reductions again. Uh, since fiscal year 16, 17, we've tried to focus more on what portion of that is something that we really could count on? Um, we look at what the timber itself, if we did revert back to just receiving timber payments, what that amount would be. We received that data um, from uh, directly from the logging activities. And so we treat that timber revenue that's being generated as ongoing operating revenue. And then we treat the SRS portion that is over and above that as one time. Um, and so we, as, as best we can, we're trying to create some structural balance in the fund so that it's not going up and down, up and down. We do have, uh, so the use of the ongoing funds, uh, the road fund portion, uh, the Oregon legislature, um, I'm not remembering the year, but many years ago allowed us to use that portion for the sheriff's office patrol services. So that timber portion of the road fund is going over to patrol. And in the general fund, it becomes part of that discretionary general fund that is allocated back on that pie chart that you saw. Um, some examples of where we spent the one-time secure rural schools money. Uh, general fund portion, a, a small amount was reserved for our state courthouse plans. So that is the capital reserve that you saw back on the slide there. There's a couple million in that reserve still. Uh, general fund and road fund um, have also been used to expand Sheriff's Office Patrol services for five years. Uh, that was part of the most recent renewals. Now that is an example of using one-time funds for something that we know is an ongoing need. Uh, so you'll hear me say that again as a caution that we, we're, we're making sure we're identifying those, but we are aware that there are things out there that would cause structural problems in the future. <clears throat> The road fund portion um, of that one-time portion has been used also for specific road and bridge projects. Uh, so this has been covered, and if there's any questions, the assessor could jump, deputy assessor could jump in and help. Uh, but this is just those dates of those measures that you've heard us refer to that I think many of us are familiar with. So Measure 5 passed in 1990, uh, Measure 47 and 50 um, occurring in 1997. And so some description here for you. Um, these things have already been stated. Uh, down at the very bottom of this slide, though, talks about the growth. Uh, while that stability uh, that has been mentioned about, uh, you know, allowing for the 3% growth in assessed value is a good thing for us, too, especially in downturns, um, it is not enough to keep up with our expense growth. Um, so that is what causes the structural deficit. Um, and so our expenses have grown on average about 5%, 4 to 5%, whereas the general fund revenue is growing 3 to 35 uh, so here a little bit more on that history of the financial management um, things. So history, we were losing the timber revenue um, and the property tax reform hitting us uh, using one-time funds for operations, a lot of budget and service reductions happening. Uh, since fiscal year 15, 16, uh, we really have focused on that one-time versus ongoing, uh, structurally balancing the budget. Uh, and we've looked at those reduction in expenses uh, that Steve Mokrohyski highlighted earlier, really trying to see where we can control our own expenses. So some forecast highlights here for you. So the general fund, I don't have the numbers here on the slide and it is ever changing as we are getting ready for budget prep here and we're still getting cost data in. Um, may I'll just highlight for you that the general fund is not structurally balanced right now. We know that that's why you're hearing that it is in distress again. Um, it's been exacerbated by COVID and things that have happened through that process, um, the costs going up. Um, you know, there's some years where that three to five percent ratio is closer together. And so we're able to stay structurally balanced for longer. And now it has spread again. 
Um, so we do estimate the structural imbalance between about three and five million over the five-year forecast. Uh, that's assuming nothing has changed and nothing is fixed. Um, so um, we obviously are making plans to bring it back into structural balance. The other thing I want to highlight that's very different than fiscal year 12-13 is that we have built up our reserves um, it, to a point where we know that we can make a multi-year plan to come back into structural balance. Um, because we have a balance of the fund and a structural balance that we're tracking, it's not an instantaneous cliff. It, what it, that's what we used to experience, instantaneous cliff. We had to cut everything in order to make it there. So, so we're able to give ourselves some more flexibility to come up with a few years of a plan. So you'll start to see that through this budget process. Um, but on the revenue side, the forecast highlights property tax being the largest revenue source there, just giving you an idea of what the assessor has um, let us know he believes will be the forecast for the five years. Uh, timber revenue, we have that three-year extension uh, that provides the one-time money. It goes through 23-24, uh, so the budget we're building um, has the third year of that secure rural schools. Uh, recording revenue um, has had a 14% plus I mean, I think it's maybe a little worse than that. That's what the state was projecting decrease due to interest rate decline. Um, even though uh, that's a department revenue, I mention it just because that is an area that has a surplus of revenue. It doesn't cost as much to run deeds and records as it does as it collects. Um, so it contributes back to the general fund. Uh, marijuana revenue, the measure uh, 110 passed a couple years ago has dramatically decreased the county's portion of that. Um, so counties were supposed to receive a certain percent that's being diverted. Um, and so it's gone down about a million dollars and it was about 1.6 million at its high, just to give you an idea. So more than 50%. Um, that marijuana revenue had helped us um, stay structurally balanced during those couple years that it was growing. Uh, car rental tax, uh, just a kind of a tourism mechanism uh, indicator there for us too, rebounded faster than anticipated. We saw the same thing with transient room tax and some other things that aren't necessarily in this fund, but just show the strength of that area. On the forecast expense side, wages, of course, uh, continued growth due to market adjustments and cost of living increases. And we know that the labor market most recently, it resulted in some large market adjustments at the county as well, needing to look at all of our positions. Um, benefits, uh, also very costly area for the county, are medical. We are self-funded for medical, so we pay our claims and then we pay an insurance company just to administer. So we have eliminated that profit for insurance companies there, but uh, the claims costs go up, then our costs go up, and they have dramatically been going up in the last year. Um, so we, are, we will need to raise rates 8% in fiscal year 23-24. Now we went self-funded in fiscal year 15-16, if I remember right, and this is only the third rate increase that we have experienced. Um, the and the first one was about one and a half percent. So we've had a couple years of increases now, um, but overall it has been very beneficial for us to be self-funded. And prior to that, Christine, it was annual increases, as I recall. Oh, yes. Double digit. Yeah. I think when we looked back at the 10-year history, it had increased 100%. And yeah, yeah, it was huge. The fact that we, we had years of no increase or even years where increases were one and a half and even at 8%, in the market, you typically look at public and private sector 10, 12, sometimes even more than that. So, so the fact that we've been able to manage and control these costs so effectively over the past eight years, I think, is a tribute to you know the focus that we've had and the collaboration and trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear a lot more uh, for the, from the wellness program and human resources about the things that they do to help with those medical claim costs. Um, so PERS, our employer rate increases or is adjusted, but does increase, is has been the trend um, every biennium. Um, so 23-25 is an increase and we'll have the same rate for two years. Um, so that's occurring in this next fiscal year as well. In June of 2022, uh, we sold, uh, sorry, I mentioned the old one first, 2002 was it the first time that the county issued a PERS bond to prepay our PERS liability. Um, and we do that in order to then invest those uh, funds and the um, 
with the idea being that your interest rates on that debt will be lower than the amount that you're investing and earning. Um, and so we are close to paying off that 2002 bond. We have a few years left. And so we have a smoothing fund internally, meaning we reserve, we adjust the rate so it's not bouncing around too. Um, and so that rate is gonna continue to go down over the last few years of that. Um, and then in June of 2022, we sold another bond um, that is expected to bring savings over the 20 years. Um, and so we have that uh, going on with our PERS as well. Uh, material and services, we look to the Oregon uh, economic forecast, the December forecast to kind of guide our budget preparation for the coming year. Um, so they are estimating for the West region a 2.8% CPI. And I'm showing you the five year projection right now going out. Um, so we'll be using that number as we go through our budget process. Uh, there's areas in the material and services budget that we can't limit to that, but that's just our, our guide. Um, some cautions, I did mention already the first one being that we know we have some places where there's one-time funding providing uh, service levels that really, uh, the first one being one that's not going to go away, that, that need for patrol is still there, but we are using some one-time funds to fund it. Um, we do also have things in the general fund budget like our holiday farm fire recovery staff and our American Rescue Plan staff that are funded with one-time money with, the, uh, with those monies from American Rescue Plan. Some other uh, funding sources I just wanna highlight, and not all of these are in the general fund, but as has been described, the general fund is the mothership and it definitely feels the pressure when other funds are losing revenue. Um, so when we see state funding decline in areas like community corrections and JRI funding, it can definitely put pressure on the general fund because those are so critical. And if there's a decision to shift general fund to those services, then it impacts the, the remaining services there. And of course, the public safety levy um, is extremely critical. Um, so I mentioned uh, where we are right now on the general fund forecast, but uh, next steps is that we will finalize and kind of verify it as we go through departments preparing their budgets. So they're gonna go out there and find out what their department revenues really look like, um, update all of our budgets for current employees in positions and get all of our costs and cost data. And so we'll come back to you uh, in May with the budget committee to let you know what the forecast looks like at that time and also determine anything in the proposed budget that has been made in that plan to bring it back into structural balance. Nothing going on there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look for a queue for questions or comments, Vice Chair. Thank you. Since we since we have a minute, quick question about the Measure One Ten, just to um, revenue, just to make sure I'm understanding the. It had historically been at about two point five, and we lost about a million dollars in that revenue, right? And those are taxes collected on products sold in Lane County. Is that right, or this, is it an import? Is it, I guess I'm trying to understand that mechanism, and if it's easier for us to just have a separate conversation, that's fine. But uh, because my understanding is the diversion of those funds. It's not that the revenue has gone down. It's that our share of it has been diverted. Correct. Due to 110. Um, but do we know if those diverted funds are being spent in Lane County or did those go into a statewide fund and, and they're being allocated on a different formula? I'm going to look and see if Alex Kyler has. Did he leave? Uh, I, yeah, I can. Oh, well, there you go. Steve Adams. Well, so the uh, the majority of the diverted funds, and Alex may have numbers right on the top of his head, went specifically to the Oregon Health Authority, to the Behavioral Health uh, the Division, burns, right. um, and specifically created kind of a citizens panel um, who then sat on um, uh, the kind of allocation and distribution. There were quite lengthy delays in the allocation of those dollars over a year, as memory serves, um, before those dollars, they finally have started to come out just within the last six months or so to many uh, community-based organizations are receiving direct um, allocations, uh, funding a lot of harm reduction and other kinds of uh, related initiatives. Thank you, yeah, and I was aware of that process and I do know, I do know there is um, some recipients here locally, but, but if I'm understanding you, the answer to my question is taxes are being collected from products sold within Lane County going to OHA to allocate through their own mechanism totally and so we are, we are potentially losing up to $1 to all the dollars of that collected here in Lane County revenue, right? Yes. Not, not the and, county as and, an organization, but the county as a 
geography. Indeed, and municipalities as well. Okay. Municipalities retained uh, those, those revenues, and we retained revenues that were um, outside of municipal boundaries, um, even though many of the services that were um, we provide within municipal boundaries as well are impacted. Save for, save for the local tax, right? So if, if a community has a local tax, then City of Eugene collects, uh, I think, close to a million dollars a year now in local taxes. Ours is far less because we have far fewer retailers in unincorporated Lane County. I think ours is only about $80,000 a year or so now in revenue. So, But you're right, the other dollars have gone away. We've had a couple of legislative proposals to try to backfill local governments that have thus far been unsuccessful. I expect we'll see a <laughs> session. And I will just say on Measure 110, I think the, the other significant impact is to the Community Corrections Act because many fewer would-be defendants uh, have entered the pipeline or en won't enter the pipeline and that has a direct impact on the both JRI and um, uh, CCA funding. Thank you. That's about a thousand cases a year of possession of contro controlled substance that aren't filed and aren't going to supervision. Thank you. Any further questions? Christine, great job. And uh, once again, you know, you tend to answer questions as they come up throughout the year. You're pretty efficient and effective at doing that. So uh, that's part, probably part of the reason you don't have more questions in this queue. Um, so. A couple more slides for you. Thank you. Yes. And it takes a village, as you've seen. <laughs> so it is definitely not me. I send the emails out to get the answers on many things. Um, and I, yeah. And just really quickly, I do have to recognize um, the budget staff that is hiding under the screen over there, mm -hmm. Jennifer Violet and Jason Miles. We are short staffed. We should have a couple more soon, um, but they make all the magic happen behind. And then everyone behind me who has specifically been invited to this meeting are very involved with budget and many people watching too. Um, so it, it, we're all involved in it. It takes all of us. Um, so really quickly on the budget calendar, and you saw some of this on Steve's slide as well, um, but budget kickoff with our departments is next Tuesday, um, and then they will be submitting their budgets to the central budget office where we will review, analyze, ask questions, um, and then meet with the county administrator um, and those departments in March uh, where he can determine what adjustments might need to be made, um, sometimes discussing ad requests, reductions. Um, and then we, he will prepare the budget and we'll prepare that budget document, um, which I would point you to for many things such as acronyms and um, an org chart and all of those things really do live in the budget document. That is the place where you will find them. Um, and May and June, uh, we'll come back to you with the budget committee and approval and eventual adoption of the budget. So uh, also the initial budget direction, I've mentioned most of this, um, but so for the personnel budget, when we uh, build it, we do assume only already approved cost of living increases or market adjustments. So the board has to have made an order on those for us to include them in the budget. Um, we do take into account vacancy variance, and by that we mean w uh, we're not going to budget and assume that we're going to have 100% employment. We just heard that's impossible. So um, we're going to look at what our vacancy rate is and make sure that our personnel budget is not too high um, so that we're not making reductions based on a budget. Uh, the benefits I mentioned, the 8% medical rate increase, will adjust our benefits for PERS and medical, and uh, we'll look for anywhere that we might be able to mitigate. We look where we might have reserves and other benefit funds or anything that we can do to mitigate anytime we're having these big increases like medical and PERS. And on the material and services, um, CPI growth will try and limit to the 2.8%. So goals overall continue to be structurally balancing all of our funds or having a plan to achieve because as you've heard, not all of them are structurally balanced right now. Uh, we have a 20% minimum reserve policy for the general fund, so we'll continue to maintain that. We are over that 20% right now, which is enabling us to have these couple years to make a plan to bring it back into balance. Uh, maintain current service levels as a goal and then plan to ensure future stability. Um, so when those one-time funds in that I've highlighted. All right. So uh, I'll be try to be relatively brief in wrapping up. I, I love these three hours that we spend every year because you get a condensed um, insight into the passion and skill and talent and commitment of the people 
uh, in this organization. And so you heard from a handful of our leaders here today, but they are a reflection. That, that passion and skill and talent is a reflection of what we have throughout the organization. So when we talk about things like you know, innovation and solving problems, it's the people that do that, right? It's the people here in this room and the other people that aren't in this room that we rely on to help us solve these challenges. Um, and it just so, as all of our presenters, you know, we're talking today, boy, you just see all of that, don't you? The passion that everyone had, despite the challenges and the limited resources and the complex issues that we're dealing with, you see a deep passion among our people to do this work, a commitment, a skill and talent, and then a desire and an understanding that really if we're gonna do it effectively, we have to work together to do it. Um, I spend a fair amount of time thinking about scarcity and abundance. These are both realities, right? You can have a scarcity of resources or an abundance of resources, but they're also mindsets, right? We can have a scarcity mindset and we can have an abundance mindset. They both come with pros and cons. A scarcity mindset brings with it, on the pro side, a focus, um, and maybe oftentimes efficiency, because we don't have a lot of this thing, right? We don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of money, so let's try to use it to the best of our ability, but it also brings with it um, a, so oftentimes a mentality of, oh, we can't do very much because we don't have a lot of this thing. Um, oftentimes it can create almost an over obsession with what we don't have. So you see that in organizations and in, in the public sector in particular that don't have a lot of resources. There can be a tendency to be obsessively focused on what we don't have. And when you look at our budget, we, act, we have a lot of resources. We don't have enough resources in some critical areas, but we have a lot of other resources in other places. So um, abundance, uh, likewise, has some pros. It creates some comfort. It creates a little bit more of a can-do attitude. We have a little bit more time. We have a little bit more money. Whatever the, thing, the abundance we have is, um, that's good. That can fuel some, some positive elements, but it also uh, can bring some inefficiency with it, right? Oh, I, I have a lot of time for this project. We have a lot of money to do this thing. So what I want to suggest here is that as we move forward and what we really have tried to do in the last several years that I think has been successful is try to identify the pros within both abundance and scarcity mindsets and capture those and not get sucked into the negatives, right? Let's not get sucked into a can't do. You heard several people today say, what about this? Can we do that? And you heard yes. Yes, you heard more, I heard more yeses today than I heard noes, despite all of the challenges and concerns that people have. So in the past eight years, we balanced, balanced $6 million structural deficits in the road fund and the general fund without one layoff as a result of, uh, of budget constraints. And that's our goal going into next year, in the next several years. We're gonna try to pace ourselves and chip away at this problem. We wanna do it by maintaining the service levels that we have, not reducing our employment, but it's really gonna require us to embrace change and innovation, something our organization has done really well in the last few years. Many of our folks are burned out by that change in innovation that has been forced. So we gotta recognize that we're tired. Um, it's, it's been a long slog. But I also wanna say, you know, if we look at, look at the, what the pandemic did to many private businesses, the private sector that was able to adapt and flex to that rapid change that was forced, that was unexpected, thrived. Businesses that were not able to adapt and flex to that rapid change, failed. And so that's, we need to have this mindset as we move forward. We have a lot of challenges, we have complex issues that have to be addressed and we have limited resources to tackle those issues, but I have a great deal of confidence with the people that we have in this organization. Uh, if we lean into the, the pros in the mindset of scarcity and abundance and don't get sucked into the negative aspects of that, that will be successful. So we'll conclude there. This was a high level overview. We're gonna get into a lot more detail as we go through the process. We have a few minutes, uh, Chair, if you have any uh, wrap up questions or comments. I, I think you've done a great job of bringing us in uh, on schedule. Uh, you you mentioned something that uh, that uh, I heard just recently, and that is John Locke said this: "Don't let the things you don't have prevent you from using the things that you do have." 
and I would add the word efficiently. And uh, that's what we're all about here today. So any questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners as we, uh, as we adjourn, prepare to adjourn? It's not a board meeting, so it's not mine to adjourn, so I'll just say goodbye instead of saying we're adjourned. But uh, with that, Mr. McRice, I think uh, we're concluded with business for the day. And our next meeting is, uh, next regular board meeting is a week from this coming Tuesday. So, very good. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today.